Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the We Are Developers Live Days. My name is Benedict, I'm Community Manager here at We Are Developers and I'm glad that you all made it today. So today's all about Java, uh, Python, sorry. <laughs> but before we start with it, uh, just some quick infos for you. We are co-hosting a meetup next week in Berlin, the Infobit Connect meetup to be precise. Just click the link in the description to get further information. And also, on other news, our World Congress is back as an in-person event starting in July in Berlin. And today we made it especially easy for you to get further information. Just click the banner we, we placed above the video to go to worldcongress.dev to get further information and to claim your tickets. And during the talks, feel, fr feel free to interact with each other. And if you got any questions, submit them via the Ask button. But as, as, as usual, be nice to each other and respect each other as we have a code of conduct. Here's a short video about it. And now right into Python. The first speaker of the day is staff software engineer at Ren.co. He loves simplicity and in this way he writes his tutorials and courses for testdriven.io. And as a sportsy guy that he is, in his leisure time, he's, he enjoys windsurfing, skiing, playing squash and hiking. Welcome, Jan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you all for, um, for joining today. Pleasure is all ours. Jan, happy to have you. Um, before we start with your session, would you mind telling the audience and me a bit about what we are going to learn from you? Yeah, sure. So today I'll be talking about running your salary workers on top of AWS CCS. Um, I'll teach you um, how to configure salary um, and what to, what to think into account when designing your background tasks in order to successfully run things um, while continuously deploying to Elastic Container Service on AWS, this in a nutshell. All right, yeah, nice topic to start off today, I would say. You got my full attention, and I would say without, without further ado, the stage is all yours, Jan. Thank you. So as I said, thank you all for coming um, to listen to my salary on AWS ECS, um, the art of background test and continuous deployment talk. Um, before we dive deep into the topic, let me introduce myself. So as mentioned earlier, I'm staff software engineer at Trend.co, where we are building uh, intelligence tool to give people uh, meaningful meaningful way um, reasons to connect um, with their clients prospects um, and people in their network um, i'm also out of tutorials and courses regarding fast api and aws um, test driven development and um, anything python related or test driven.io if you're interested you can follow me on twitter um, that's my twitter handle you can also find me on linkedin um, so Let's jump straight in. Um, so yeah, anytime you have any more than a tutorial app, um, you'll end up in a place where you'll need 
um, lo- um, async background tasks in one way or the other. Usually, that me you uh, you end up there when you need to run some long running tasks like deleting all users' data. Um, when you have a lot of it, it may take hours or even days to to um, to execute such tasks. Um, you may want to run some repeated, usually scheduled tasks like sending newsletter um, every Monday. Um, or you have tasks that need retries, um, like sending welcome email. It's not that important that you send welcome email immediately um, when the user do the sign up. But the important part is that it's being sent eventually. So you don't want to block user just because your email provider is down. And that's also something you may uh, push to background um, and you have a sync background task to, to handle. Um, in the past, um, year or so, um, I spent quite a lot of time dealing with salary on AWS. Um, there were um, quite many fires on Friday evenings and also on weekends and whatnot. So everything I'll tell you today about this topic is really from first had experience on Battlefield, not just some theory you can read in documentation and so on. So yeah, if you are in Python community, you probably heard about the salary um, and if you want to process any background async test, you'll probably go with it because um, it's most widely used test queue uh, for Python. Um, it uses message broker like Redis or RabbitMQ. There is also support for um, SQS and a couple of others. Um, Celery will is a protocol which sends messages um, and reads them from the message broker. Um, they are read um, from message broker on workers and the tests that were submitted from your application server or from anywhere else um, are then processed on these workers. Um, so for example, you, you submit tasks to send welcome email on your uh, application server, the um, message is written to, to message broker and then worker picks this message up and process the desired task. Um, salary also comes with salary beat. Uh, for scheduled tasks where you can define cron- with cron-like syntax when do you want to your- run your repeated tests. So, for example, every Monday morning, 7 a.m. or something like that. So when you, um, there are also other uh, test queues in Python like um, Python Redis queue um, and some others, but they are not that um, battle tested um, and that wide- widely spread. So. Um, if you want to, if you want to to do something um, a bit more, um, let's say tested and um, something running on production, then salary is usually the the choice. So when you decide to to use salary, then you need to decide where where to run that. And if you are inside AWS ecosystem, um, Elastic Container Service ECS with Fargate is. Uh, very good um, and also obvious choice for a couple of reasons. There is no provisioning of, of servers. You um, need Docker image only, so you just need to push um, Docker image to Elastic Container Registry and then define it inside inside ECS task. Uh, um, therefore, it's easy to increase resources like CPU and memory per worker. It's also fairly easy to scale up and down. You can do that via CLI or um, um, inside console um, in your web browser. You can also define uh, auto scaling policies um, and scale up and down based on memory or CPU consumption and so on. Um, and it's also fairly easy to deploy. You can use any AWS library. So um, for example, Bola 3 for Python, or you can you just use CLI um, one way or the other. You just define some JSON specification of task and that's it. Um, so no need to manu- manually patch um, packages on, on servers, uh, no need to um, to be to sweat about uh, what if we go out of uh, resources because you can really do that just by um, redeploying with um, with more defined resources. Um, so um, uh, the Fargate is serverless compute service, so no servers there to to manage the provision or what, or anything else like that. So um, when you're running salary workers on top of ECS Fargate, um, I suggest you um, 
defined stop timeout of 120 seconds. That's the time between a sick term and sick kill. This is used by ECS to stop the running containers. Um, so first sick term is sent and if container is running after the stop timeout, a sick kill is sent to forcefully kill the container. So this way you give containers as much time as possible to gracefully exit. Um, so that if there is any um, any cleanup or anything uh, done inside a container when it needs to uh, when it needs to stop, this can be uh, this can be done. The one hundred and twenty seconds is the max value, so um, you cannot extend it more. Um, the other thing to do is to set minimum healthy percent to fifty. So this means that at all times during every deployment, um, you'll have at least fifty percent of healthy targets. So this means that at least 50% of workers will be actually doing some stuff. Um, you can also set these to zero if you don't care whether um, you have times where there are no workers running or not. Um, you can also set these to 100%, but this means that at some point you have twice as many uh, workers as you wish. Um, and if there are a lot of them, this might also um, this may also sums up in, in quite some dollars um, on your AWS bill because um, the the deployments usually take at least, I'd say roughly two minutes or so to replace all the running containers with the new ones. So um, as I mentioned, when you, when you uh, deploy to AWS, um, to AWS ECS Fargate, um, you um, you do that via API on, on AWS. And then ECS kills current containers um, that are running and starts new ones, depends on healthy percent, um, how, how the order of, of these actions is executed. But in a nutshell, so the container that is running, it receives seek term signal. And then after the two minutes, if it's not um, stopped yet, it receives seek kill. So um, every time you deploy, you have interruptions, which means that your workers might be interrupted during their work. So the test may, may not be processed until the end. Um, the same goes for scaling actions. So whenever you are doing upscaling, um, you are just starting new containers, but as soon as you're doing downscaling container, current containers are killed. So if you're scaling for 20, from 24 to 20 workers, um, four containers will be killed. And also this means that um, the tasks that are being processed in these workers might be interrupted. Um, so how does this look like in a continuous deployment setup? Um, continuous deployment means that you have frequent deployments, um, ideally multiple times per day. Um, and as mentioned, every deployment is an interruption for your workers running on ECS. This may, this may end up in a state where long tasks, if they are running for, let's say, five hours, may not be finished during the office hours um, because they are always interrupted by deployment. So, for example, if you deploy 10 times per day in eight hours so of your office hours, so this would be, let's say, roughly every 45 minutes or so. Um, so the task will start. Um, it will run for 45 minutes. It, it won't do all the work, container will be killed and, you, um, and you'll need to retry and um, process this task and you'll process task for 45 minutes, another deployment will kick in and you'll end up in, in a task not being processed until you finish office hours. And um, there is at least five hours of steady state where um, there are no interruptions. Also, the problem is the test might be lost due to workers being ungracefully killed. So as I said, first sick term is sent, then sick kill. So um, if the worker is lost uh, with sick kill um, or for any other reason, um, you might lose task if you don't configure salary properly. So the question is then how to configure salary in order to support such environment um, that you don't get um, lost tasks. Um, and that you can deploy as frequently as possible. 
So the first thing to set up is late test acknowledgement. By default, this is set to false. So tests are acknowledged whenever they are received. So this means that message is read for a message broker, um, task is received, task processing starts. Um, and if it's, um, if it's processed, it's processed. If the worker is killed in the meantime, task is considered as being successfully processed. So this way, if you have such environment as described earlier, task may never be successfully processed because it's acknowledged before it's actually processed. So if there is any interruption for any reason, um, the task won't be, won't be processed, although mark is processed. So we need to use late acknowledgement. So after the task is successfully processed, so first we need to process test, then acknowledge message in the message broker. We can do that by using um, task X late. Um, we can set it to true. And when this is set to true, seller we will acknowledge task after they are processed. So that's the first step towards more reliable processing. The next thing is visibility timeout. So by default, this is set to one hour. Um, and this is time before task is retried by some other worker if it was not acknowledged. So for example, worker A picks up a task, it starts processing it, um, worker is killed, so there is no acknowledgement. The next worker will be, uh, worker B will pick up this task after one hour by default. Um, if we have many interruptions from scaling and from deployment, the one hour of visibility timeout might be a bit painful because there will be one hour gap between the test being um, processed for the first time and not successfully and um, the time when it's retried on the other worker. Um, one thing we need to, to be careful about here is that the longest uh, timeout that we have it for our test must not be longer than visibility timeout because otherwise we'll end up in duplicated processing, which might, which might cause us a lot of trouble. So, what we want here is to keep it short to quickly retry test in case of killed worker. Um, but we don't want to, um, to have it too short so that we would have duplicated processing. Um, the rough thumb rule to which um, I would aim is 15 minutes. So 15 minutes it seems like a time in which you can process quite a lot of things, um, but it's long. Um, but it's short enough that if you retry test because the worker was lost for any reason, um, you'll still won't wait too too much to to, um, to come to this point. So you can configure that on um, the broker transport options, and you set visibility timeout to fifteen minutes. The next thing you need to be careful about is countdown um, salary. The documentation claims that you can use countdown or ETA to execute ta um, tasks in some uh, later point in time. That's that is true to some degree, but not exactly the case because the task with countdown is picked from the message broker and then it's stored inside worker's memory until the countdown passes. So this means that your worker may have a lot of tasks with countdown inside its memory. Worst case, it may even go out of memory because of these tasks, but that's usually not that problematic. Uh, more problematic is the case that you may, you may have 10 or 20 tasks inside worker memory. Um, and if the worker is killed, you'll lose all those tasks. So um, you'll need to wait for a visibility timeout for all of them to be picked up. And also, um, one thing you need to you need to um, take into account is that if calm down is greater than visibility timeout, tasks will be processed multiple times. As I said, tasks are stored in worker memory, um, and workers are acknowledged late. So this means that um, task is picked up by, by a worker but not processed, so it's not acknowledged. Therefore, after visibility timeout, another worker will pick up this same task. So worst case, you may end up. Um, in a state where you process one task with countdown as many times as you have uh, workers available. So ideally, don't use it, but sometimes um, you may want to use it, but be very careful. So um, if you need to, to run task at some, at some point in time, rather use scheduling or some other 
strategy to, to achieve that. So the next thing is um, you need to reject task on worker loss. Um, default, this is set to false. Tasks are not rejected when the worker is lost. Worker can be lost when it goes out of memory um, or if some unexpected error happens um, or if you kill it with seed kill. Um, so in such case, um, uh, with default setting, all the tasks will be acknowledged when the worker abruptly exits or is killed by a signal, even when you have a late acknowledgement set up. Why this is done this way, don't ask me. Um, if you don't set these to true, which you can do by setting task reject and worker loss setting on salary configuration, your task may not be fully processed because um, as I said, when we deploy um, worker receive seek term and then seek kill signals, uh, the same with scaling. Um, and there might also be some other interruptions. I don't know, um, the region might go down for some reason or something like that. And um, in, if this is not enabled, worker um, tasks that were interrupted during processing on worker will be lost. So you want to set this to true. Salary documentation warns you here that you need to know what you're doing because you may end up in infinite message loop. Um, that might be the case if your workers would be lost due to um, going out of memory or something like that. But on um, ECS Fargate, that's not that big of a problem because worst case, you can just increase the available memory uh, to your uh, workers, just redeploy and the task will be processed and you can deal with the reasons for uh, for worker going out of memory uh, at a later point. So there is no server which would have limited uh, memory and you cannot increase over it. So um, I think that the largest memory available is roughly is 32 or maybe even 64 gigabytes on Fargate. So if you if that's not enough, then nothing will be enough most likely. Um, so yeah, be careful, but in general, if you want to prevent task loss, so if you want to ensure at least once processing for every test, you need to set this to true. Another thing to, to take into consideration is the prefetch multiplier. By default, this is set to four, and this means how many tasks are prefetched during the processing of, um, of another task. Um, so, for example, one task is being processed, three others are being prefetched and waiting in the worker's memory so that as soon as the one that's being processed is done, um, the next task is just picked up from memory instead of um, calling to message broker. Um, most of the time, the processing time of task is large enough that you won't gain anything by having um, prefetched task in your memory. So um, the latency of um, of calling to to your message broker is um, is too small to to have any any visible effect um, on your processing. So um, you want to set this to one, especially in continuous deployment setup for um, for the next reason. So you don't want to lose task for no reason if the if the container is killed. For any, um, for, for any reason. So if you set, if you leave that to four, what might happen is one task is being processed three inside worker's memory, worker is lost. You'll need to wait for visibility timeout for all, for all the four tasks to be picked up by another worker before, before they are actually processed. If you set this to one, um, as suggested here, um, you can do that by worker prefetch multiplier salary config setting. Um, if the task is interrupted, only this task will be retried after visibility timeout. Other tasks will be processed somewhere else or won't even be picked up from, from the message broker um, before a deployment is finished. And it will be processed eventually when there is enough resources and workers to, to, do, um, to do the processing. Last, but not least, 
part of salary configuration when running on AWS ECS Fargate is to do signal remapping. Um, this one is probably the one that's hardest to figure out because there is nothing written about that in official documentation. Um, and it's also not the direct salary thingy. Um, it's a thing of um, library that salary uses for, for multiprocessing, which is called DDR. Um, and you can find that in the documentation for running salary workers on Heroku. So this one, um, this one was really hard to find. And there is one GitHub issue mentioned somewhere. Um, so what does this do? Um, by default, sick term executes worm shutdown. So worm, worm shutdown means that salary worker tries to finish the processing of the currently processed task um, and then exit. If you have um, only two minutes of stop timeout, as um, mentioned in the earlier slide, so there is at most two minutes available to do the processing till the end. Um, you might end up in a state where um, first worker receives sick term and it uh, initiate worm shutdown. It's waiting for a task to finish. Um, nothing happens because the task is still being processed and then it's forcefully killed with sick kill. What um, we want to do instead of worm shutdown is to do cold shutdown because in such case, the worker is behaving the same way as in worker loss scenario. So the task will be retried after visibility timeout. This way we ensure that no task is lost at any point. So every task is processed at least once. So this means that we guarantee at least one, at least once processing. Um, we can do that by setting remap seek term to, um, to seek quit environment variable um, inside our container and um, from thereafter, when the container receive um, seek term, this will go to secret, which will initiate the cold shutdown of workers and um, your task will be immediately interrupted, considered as um, worker lost. Uh, so it will be retried by some other worker after visibility timeout as, as already mentioned. So yeah, that's, how the example salary configuration looks like. Um, so we have the broker transport options to set visibility timeout. We um, um, we configure late acknowledgement. We configure to reject um, task on worker loss and we set prefetch multiplier um, to one. So now that we know how to configure salary, we must also discuss our task. So the async background task needs to have um, some properties in order to successfully and reliably process them. So first thing that we want to do is we want to aim to have max processing, processing time below 15 minutes. Anything more than 15 minutes will probably end up in a scenario um, as I mentioned earlier, so where, where there will be a lot of time needed to actually process tests because the likelihood of interruption is too big. Um, we want to aim to typical processing time of under two minutes um, because we don't want to retry um, longer than the necessary. So if the two minute task is interrupted just slightly before the finish, there is not much to, to uh, reprocess, but if it's longer, for example, of 50 minutes, this uh, this can significantly decrease the throughput of, of our system if there are um, a lot of interruptions. These numbers are not hard rules. So these are really just empirical values uh, from my um, and my team's observation. So if you, um, if you aim to somewhere here, you should be fine. Um, the task that you are um, running needs to be item potent, which means that if you're ru running them multiple times, things must not break um, and they must produce same result every time. So be careful about that. Um, also, always use retries with exponential back off um, with jitter. So for example, if external API is down or you hit race limits or anything, 
you don't want Turkey Task to retry at the same time um, because even if you did not encounter rate limits previously, you might end up with all these retries. So in such case, um, it's better to use exponential backup. So this means that um, the gap between current try and the next retry is exponentially increasing. So it will be the span time will be longer and longer. And Jitter adds this randomness so that um, tasks that are that failed at the same time for the first time won't be retried at exactly the same time next time. Um, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk mostly about the short part because the item potent can be pretty domain specific. Um, and the retries are not that interesting because this is just a thing that you can configure by following the official salary documentation. Um, so nothing much discussed there. So yeah, what we aim with this short is that maximal test processing time is shorter than typical window between deployments, right? So that's what we want to achieve. So if we deploy every 15 minutes, we want all the tests to, to always run under 15 minutes, even for the worst cases. Um, so how can we achieve that when designing our tests? The first thing we can do is to leverage fan out. So what does that mean? Let's say we need to send emails to, to all of our users. Like I mentioned, for example, um, weekly newsletter on Monday morning. If we have single job, we have a problem. So if we have 10 users, the job will take let's say 10 seconds because sending email via API takes one second for every call. Um, we, if we have thousand users, this means thousand seconds. If we generalize that n users and seconds, this means that the processing time of this single job is increasing um, quite rapidly. So if we take a look even for thousand users, which honestly it's not a lot of users, will go over 15 minutes in our case. So 900 seconds is 15 minutes, 10,000 is even more than that. So even for 4,000 users, this might be a problem. Yes, we can do that in parallel inside single job, but the, this way you might um, hit the rate limits of the API much, much sooner. Um, and also you um, you don't isolate the things. So um, for example, if you have this task interrupted after thousand user, um, you'll end up um, processing these users twice. What we can do is to do fan out. Um, so we can separate the part that um, that schedules email sending um, and the actual email sending. So this part will only list all of our users and therefore every user um, another job will be submitted. So this means that we will, we will have N plus one jobs if we have N users. This processing time for these jobs are roughly constant because it really depends on the third party API, but not that important. So for one user, we, should, we can consider that this processing time is roughly constant. Um, so even if we have 10 million users, who cares? Uh, the um, processing time for, for said job won't increase. The processing time for these job will increase, but much, much slower. So um, here we can, we can do a calculation like this. So for 10 users, 0 0.1 seconds, because we do only database operations and, um, and job submitting, which is um, very fast. And then for 1,000 users, 10 seconds, or if we generalize that, or n users and divided by 100 seconds. So this way, the processing time growth is much, much slower comparing to this one. So we can handle way more, um, way more users for the same case. Um, there are also limits. Um, obviously, we can do that also in multiple layers. So for example, let's say that we see that we can handle, I don't know, one million users with this approach, and then we have 2 million users or 3 million users, we can do a partitioning, um, for example, and we can have once a job that just lists all, all the partitions and jobs for, for these partitions, and then for every partition, we do that. So we can this way, we can just by adding layers, essentially cover 
basically as many um, as many um, users or any other things as possible. Um, so, yeah, as I said, um, processing time increases much slower, um, and we can use multiple layers to um, to 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 do the stuff if there are more more things to do. There are also trade offs or downsides. So this submits a lot of tasks at, at once. So this means that the workers are usually completely jammed. So even if you submit something just slightly after all of these fan out tasks were submitted, you'll need to wait for all the tasks to finish before your, um, before your new task will be processed. So when to do that, when these are high priority tasks, the ones that need to be finished as soon as possible and you don't want to wait and everything else will need to wait. Um, in such case, this is a, um, a great approach to achieve what you what you want to achieve. Another option is to use batching. So what do we do here? Instead of having single job that um, does the same thing as previously, so send emails to all users, we can do batching. So in every run of job, we can send emails to 100 users, and then if there are more users to process, we resubmit the same job um, again and start where we left off. This way we achieve roughly constant processing time because the batch size is constant. So if 100 users takes 100 seconds, this will be pretty much the same for all runs. We need cursor where to continue, so, um, this that um, therefore this might be a bit harder to implement compared to fan out but for example uh, what you can do let's say we are still the user example so you can list users order, ordered by id um, and you always list batch of 100 users and you use the last um, ID of the last process id of the last process user as cursor so next time you do the query inside the job um, you just query users after this ID. Um, this occupies only one worker at the time to do the same job. So um, you won't jam everything, although there might be 16 hours of processing time to do everything. Obviously, it takes more time to finish the whole process because you're still doing things sequentially, one after the other. Nothing is done in parallel. Um, but if interrupted, it continues from the beginning of the interrupted batch, not from the beginning of the whole process. So let's say you process already 300 users and uh, 300 to 400, there is interruption. Um, when tasks will be retried, you'll continue at 300 to 400 instead of uh, reprocessing from, from, the, from the complete beginning. Um, yeah, and the last thing to... Um, to mention here is task locking. So um, what might happen is that two workers pick up the same task and we obviously don't want to um, do parallel processing, at least in many cases, but the best way is if you can build a system which is completely um, uh, independent to, to this. We can achieve that by using locking in Radix. Um, what we need to take into account is to use auto expire with lock, so that slightly smaller value, um, use slightly smaller value than for, for visibility timeout. So if there are interruptions and retries, that um, you won't be blocked by this lock. Um, so for locking, what can we do? Um, so in case that there is already another worker processing the task, we can ignore the task on another worker. This ensures at most once processing. So um, when the worker that picked up the, the task first is killed, so for example, there is new deployment, such task won't be processed till the end because it will be considered as successful from the worker that picked it up the second because salary does not know what is the work that needs to be done? It just um, it just checks whether there was a success uh, returned from the uh, worker or not, um, and that's it. So if you if at most once processing is what you want, then just ignore the test. Um, the next thing you can do is to resubmit the task with same arguments. So this ensures at least once processing. So even when the worker is lost 
or killed, um, you, you'll process the, the task for sure because another, another worker that picked it up will resubmit it. Um, and well, won't be con and although it will be considered a successfully processed um, and it wasn't, there will be another task that will do the job that needs to be done. Um, you can also just retry the task, which is conceptually more correct than resubmission, but in such case, you might run out of retries because you specified the uh, fixed number of retries and you cannot distinguish between these retries and the ones from exceptions. Um, you might end up in, in getting out of retries if you have multiple interruptions in a row. So most likely you'll use this one, but depend, uh, depending on your needs, you can use any, any of these. <sighs> Great, so yeah, that's, that's it regarding the presentation, but I can show you the code examples quickly um, for these task implementations. Um, you can check the resources here um, to learn more. And also here is a link to the um, GitHub repository, which contains all these code examples and also this presentation. Um, so let's switch to PyCharm for a couple of minutes. So as I said, this is the salary configuration um, that we want. And then here we have, we have a send newsletter well, this is single job, so we list all users and send email for every user inside the same job. <clears throat> the next thing is this one. So this is fan out. We use one job to, um, to list all the users and to submit job that actually sending email. That's this one. So um, as you can see, database access and job submission is here. Actual email sending is in inside each job. And then here is also batching. So we have only one job or task. Um, as I mentioned, we are using last evaluated key for our cursor. In, in our case, this is a user ID. So what we do we list all the users, um, we filter them by, um, by ID so that they are um, uh, with ID greater than last evaluated key. By default, we start to minus one because if we are using um, auto-assigned, um, auto-incremental IDs in SQL database, they will start at one. Um, we load batch size of these users and then for every user, we send an email and if there are um, less users than the batch size, so it means that we, we done our work already, we just return. Otherwise, we take the ID from the last user that was processed and we resubmit a job with this ID so that we start where we left off in the next uh, processing. Um, and the last thing here is um, the locking. So you can implement that by um, uh, writing a decorator. So what does it do? Um, it tries to uh, to acquire a lock. Um, lock is implemented inside Redis. So you need to use this set NX because um, you want to set the key only if it does not exist yet. If it already exists, it means that some other worker is already processing the task. So um, you cannot acquire a lock. And then here, if um, if you cannot acquire a lock, you resubmit the task where you just um, provide same arguments and keyword arguments, but you use a short countdown. And that's the case you know, where you where if you are using such short um, countdown, um, you should be fine um, as mentioned earlier in the presentation. And also you return this string as result of tasks so that if you are debugging anything and, um, and trying to figure out why the task was so quick, you can see, oh, okay, this was just resubmission due to not being able to acquire lock. Um, and you obviously want to release lock 
after test is successfully processed or if there was an exception so that some other worker can retry the task um, without the lock being locked. Yeah, that's it. So thank you all for listening. And as far as I know, um, you'll be able to ask questions or were able to do so during the presentation. So we can move to this to this part. Hello again, Jan. Thank you so much for the awesome presentation. So, and we still got some time left for a Q&A. So to the audience, this is your last chance to submit some questions for Jan. And Jan, um, maybe to kick it off, um, it would be awesome if you could give us some insights into your developer journey, like how your interest in tech started and how you got to the point where you are now. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a while. Um, I mean, I started uh, late in the high school where we had some um, subject wi with um, informatics and um, also some programming in Python. But then I was um, on university, I was studying uh, electrical engineering, um, the electronics. So everything below 1.1 volt. <laughs> uh, so really what, what you are using in computers and so on. Um, so yeah, then I did quite some programming there. It was mostly for digital circuits and whatnot. Um, and then I don't actually know, somehow I got one job as a student, which was a bit more like enterprise software development, something like that. Um, and yeah, I started there and yeah, from there after I just spent a lot of time doing that. Um, so yeah, then for some reason I decided to go more into software and then end up in this AWS and, uh, web development with Python. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's roughly my journey and since then i'm always searching for the best possible solutions to to deliver software of high quality um i i always struggle um when we need to to spend a lot of time to release something so yeah i did quite res quite some research on this topic and also developed quite some patterns myself that I'm now successfully using and I'm trying to to give those things back to the community as much as possible. So that's why I'm um, presenting talks like this one on, on conferences. Um, so it's the, the third time this year um, and I will present the same talk in PyCon Italy in May as well. So that that's roughly... That's on, it's on top. <laughs> on top of all your skills, you also got a uh, really cool mindset with like sharing everything with the community and giving some, something back. I appreciate, we appreciate that. So, and talking about giving something back to the community, um, we got some questions. The first one would be, do the discussed in interruption problems are also valid in a setting where the salary result backed is set to DangoDB? Yeah, these these problems are are common problems whenever you're running um, your salary workers or whenever you're processing something with salary. It's not also very specific to salary. It's a general problem with uh, basically every async task processing. Um, if you don't deploy that frequently, you might you might not um, encounter these many issues or you can live with some tasks being lost sometimes. But if you are, if you have this continuous deployment set up where you basically every change that's done is deployed to production immediately, there are so many interruptions in a day. Um, and when you add um, auto scaling even more that it's impossible to, to just say, fuck it, we'll live with it and, and not spend any time um, there. So yeah, basically, it, it relates to basically any salary setup that you have. Okay, nice. Thank you for that answer, Jan. We got some more questions. 
Um, do you have any AWS certificate like Solution Architect, for example? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I'm planning to to do uh, uh, to do that because um, I know that especially in enterprise environments, um, it's highly recommendable to have such things. But um, no, I just spent last uh, roughly seven years developing things on top of AWS. So um, really, just empirical um, empirical knowledge. Um, from a lot of experimentation and fighting with AWS limits and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, empirical uh, studies are often worth more than like some diploma or anything. But so yeah, yeah. Um, we I, I have got, a question. Sorry. Yeah, um, I got on. pretty meek. Yeah, I, I got pretty mixed uh, feedback from people regarding these state AWS certificates. And that's also one of the reasons that it was never um, high enough of my, on my to-do list to actually spend some time there. <laughs> Understandable. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. Can you recommend res resources for Python scripting on AWS? What kind of Python scripting? <laughs> I mean, if you just want to run some code that's pretty much just like computing or something like that. You can use AWS Lambda and their web IDE and just write your code there and then execute it. That's probably the easiest way to, to do something on AWS. And also you have free, uh, free tier from AWS, at least for the first year. But I think for Lambda, it's forever, if I'm not mistaken. So you, if you just do some, some simple computing a um, couple of times per day, or if you are just learning something, it should cover all of your needs. All right. Thanks for that. Um, next question. What is the best practice for running salary on AWS ECS? And how can you optimize the performance and scalability of salary workers in a containerized environment? Uh... I mean, the scalability of um, ECS, if you're running it on Fargate, is pretty much limited by the scalability of AWS region. I just talked with a guy um, who um, who is working for a company where they are hitting those physical limits for, from some of AWS regions because they are using Graviton instances or something like that. And there are not a lot of them available. But in general, I mean... For the most for the most use cases, if you are on Fargate, you're pretty much limited with with nothing. If you want to run thousand workers or ten thousand of them, just just do them, just just run them. Um, other than that, I mean, if you are on ECS with EC2 instances, it might be a bit more painful because you need to provision your servers. Also, the um, the deployments can be uh, a bit trickier to, to set up in the sense that um, you have more limited resources and it's hard to go to 50% of healthy targets at all times or at least above that. Um, so you need to go a bit lower when you when you have instances, I don't know, like 30, 40% if you don't want to hit um, limits there. But yeah, in general, best practice. I mean, if you use what I mentioned in this talk, you should be more or less fine. I mean, we are processing jobs that are that are that were taking hours before with these approaches. You can also combine fan out and batching. Depends on your use case, um, and you can achieve pretty much pretty much anything that's highly interruptible and resi resistant to. Um, to any kind of stupid stuff going on in your infrastructure. All right, yeah, thanks for this answer as well. Um, we got another one. Is there a way to collect logs from a killed worker to know the reason why it was killed? Mm, I mean, if you are running things on ECS, by default, you have logs in your CloudWatch logs. Um, I also should suggest that you connect Sentry with Salary integration. So 
um, you should have pretty much um, all that you need. If the worker is killed by C kill, there I think there is some logging from salary than like called shutdown initiated or something like that. But um, there is nothing more than that. So yeah, you can check to some degree. But yeah, I mean, usually these reasons um, are not that are not that important. I mean, for if you have Sentry connected, you'll get you'll get event if worker goes out of memory and is killed by that, or if there is segmentation fault in memory. This one is quite common from my experiences and is pretty random. Um, I haven't found any pattern that would cause the segmentation fault. Um, so yeah, if you want to know the, that much, this should be more than fine. If you want to know anything else, it's pretty much for you to dig into the salary details, but um, if you are not ready for, um, if you're not ready for tiers, then <laughs> I suggest you just connect Sentry and use the CloudWatch. And um, if there is just sick kill for from ECS, um, nothing special is reported, but that's expected, right? I mean, that's like shutting down um, Chrome on your uh, MacBook. You won't get error a message anywhere just just because you close the window. Um, talking about digging in, uh, do you have maybe some other resources to share when it comes to salary, like maybe uh, blogs or maybe even YouTube tutorials, something like that? Do you have some persons to recommend right there? Um, so some, let me just see. Um, there is a guide for salary on testdriven.io. Um, where is it? No, guides. Um, Django and salary, but it's for for Django and salary. And as far as I know, I think it's more um, oriented towards the Django and the salary integration, and not, not that much on this, let's say, operations side um, related to development. Um, I can send this link. Where can I post it? Yeah, you can, uh, since also the question came up for links from your presentation, uh, maybe you can just uh, send them to to us through uh, uh, via the private chat in StreamYard and then we will post it in the chat. So yeah, sure. the whole audience yeah. can access it. Perfect. Thank of you so much. Course. Also, the question came up, will a recorded YouTube video will uh, be available afterwards? Yes, you can watch on demand right after the session. And we are also um, editing the talks a bit and um, uploading it to our watch section on the website in a few days time. Cool. So everybody who misses something or you want to share links with your friends to educate them, feel free to do so. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, you are a staff software in engineer. Um, maybe you want to elaborate a bit on what exactly is this position and what your day-to-day -to -day work is, if there is something like day-to-day -day work. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so in, we have some internal definitions, what, what is senior, what is uh, meet software engineer, uh, principal, and so on. And if I remember correctly, we consider staff someone who is really top notch on their um, on their field, and they have um, some recognition from the community. So they have some uh, blogs posted on uh, platforms. Um, they um, they uh, do talks on conferences and stuff like that. So um, that's the the first let's say the, the first. Uh, bar that you need to um to to jump over uh but then yeah i mean that also needs to be a person who who is able to um to lead teams and assist um, them in any way possible um my current role um since it's an early stage startup is um covering pretty much everything from um, API development to um, asking job processing in the background to deploying machine learning models to um, taking care that um, Olaf, 
or our infrastructure is SOC 2 compliant, um, that our app is SOC 2 compliant. This is, this is security certificate for the US um, and, and stuff like that. So also, I don't know, <laughs> monitoring the infrastructure, monitoring the application, uh, building new features. So really um, quite wide spectrum. Um, but yeah, I mean, what might be, let's say, stuff specific comparing to senior. So I, um, I really spend a lot of time educating others um, how to how to deal better with Python code, how to be more effective um, while while developing software, how to develop software in a way that we can experiment with feature flags on production as much as possible. And yeah, this point I'd say I was pretty successful so far. So um, we don't have data science and backend completely separated anymore, but. Um, whatever is done by by uh, the data science guys is basically high quality software engineering that can be released in, to production immediately in in all senses. So regarding uh, maintainability, scalability, and all other aspects of high quality software. Yeah. Sounds awesome, Jan. Thanks for also sharing that with us. And thanks for the whole presentation. We really learned a lot today from you. Um, and hope to see you next time, maybe on another live day. And until then, wish you a nice rest of the day and see you soon. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye. All right. And before we jump to the second talk of the day, just a quick 20 second break. Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now. And right back to Python. The second speaker of the day is developer advocate in data science at JetBrains. She actually has an academic background in cl clinical psychology and biostatistics, but she spent, she, uh, she, uh, she spent the last seven years dedicated to data science. So she, she most certainly has an idea what she's talking about. Welcome, Jody. Hi, I'm super happy to be here. <laughs> and we are happy to have you, Jody. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'm here in Berlin. The, you know, winter still feels like it's not ever going to end, but looking forward to the long weekend coming up. Yeah, in, in Vienna, it's quite sunny today. So yeah, the, there is that. <laughs> so Jody, <laughs> um, before we start with the session, uh, maybe you want to also, uh, uh, also share what we are going to learn from you today? Yeah, so basically this talk is a little bit of a deep dive into how NumPy vectorized functions work. Um, so I think this can be a little bit of a hairy thing for beginners to get their head around. And um, kind of what I want to talk about in this talk is my journey to understanding these better and teaching you some tricks that I've learned from um, linear algebra in order to help you understand them better. So you don't need any mathematical background for this talk. It's totally for beginners in terms of that sense, um, but just sort of a way to help you get your head around these vectorized operations and know when you can use them in your own code. Yeah, and if there are any questions, uh, everybody's invited to just submit them by the Ask button. And without further ado, I would say, Jody, stages are yours. All right, perfect. So, uh, as I said, super happy to be here today. Um, and yeah, no need to introduce myself. Um, we've already done that. So yeah, in this talk, what I'm going to be doing is showing some ways that vectorized operations in Python can help speed up your code. And as I said, also going to explain the linear algebra behind those operations. So why did I decide to give this talk? Well, if you're anything like me, when you first started learning to program and I taught myself Python, this was my first programming language, loops were your bread and butter. So I relied really heavily on storing all of my data in lists and then looping over them. But a lesson that I really quickly learned, and unfortunately I learned it the hard way, is that when you hit any sort of scale, when you're trying to do looping, 
they get really, really slow. And this was something I initially had no idea how to deal with. So I remember really distinctly this moment, like fairly, fairly early in my data science career. And I was trying to do something that felt like it should be a fairly simple operation. And I ended up coding it as a nested for loop. And I was sitting there waiting for it to run. And I'm like, why is this taking so long? And then I did a little bit of a back of napkin calculation. And I realized that the whole process was going to take over five hours to complete. So that was the point where I started Googling around about how to make my code more efficient. But I started reading all this stuff about NumPy vectorized operations. I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand what they were doing. And it wasn't until I completed a linear algebra unit a few years back that everything sort of clicked. I realized how I could use these operations and they were going to give me the performance gains that I needed. So what I'd like to do in this talk is give an overview of a few ways that you can use vectorized operations to speed up your Python code. And we're going to do that by iteratively improving a machine learning algorithm called K nearest neighbors. So I chose this algorithm partially because I'm a data scientist, but also because I think a naive implementation of this algorithm is a really great showcase on how you can get bogged down in your code using loops and also how you can improve your code performance using vectorized operations by replacing some of those loops with vectorized operations in this algorithm. So don't worry, you don't need to be a data scientist, a machine learning engineer, you don't need to care about any of this stuff in order to get some value from this talk. But if you are interested in this stuff, you'll also get a little bit of an insight into how this algorithm can be implemented very efficiently. So we'll start by going over some basics of linear algebra, and then we're gonna quickly go through how K nearest neighbors works at a very high level. We'll then start by coding up an unoptimized implementation of KNN using loops and lists. And we're going to time how long that takes to run as our baseline. And then for the remainder of the talk, we're going to go through three different stages of optimization of our code. And at each stage, we're going to replace an inefficient part of the code with something vectorized and faster. And at each of these stages, I'm going to be explaining why these vectorized operations work by explaining the mathematical principles behind them. So let's start from the beginning with some basics of linear algebra. So the most fundamental unit in linear algebra is a vector. So you can see here three examples of vectors. Basically, they're just ordered sequences of values. So in the context of machine learning, vectors are used to represent data. And we can see that here. On the right hand side, I have an excerpt from a data set that I'm going to be using throughout this presentation. Um, it's a bit of a weird data set. It describes the physical characteristics of photographs of beans. So as you can see, it's a bit weird, but it had some really excellent properties for demonstrating what I wanted to show in this talk. So I've just gone with it. So you can see here two of the columns. We have the major axis length and the minor axis length. And that's simply just how wide and how long the pictures of the beans are. And um, what you can see is if you match this up, each of the vectors represents a single bean with the first element in the vector representing that major axis length and the second element in the vector representing that minor axis length. So what do these vectors represent in terms of linear algebra? They represent a lot of things, but for the purposes of this talk, we can think of vectors as coordinates in an n-dimensional vector space. Okay, so what is this? To illustrate this, it's always easiest to start in two dimensions. So st let's start with a scatter plot of some beans against their values for those major and minor axis lengths. So this plot here represents a two-dimensional vector space with the major axis length representing the first dimension and the minor axis length representing the second dimension. And each of the points here represents a single vector in this vector space. And we can see that with the vectors we already looked at in the last slide. So the beans data set we're going to be working with has 16 feature columns in total, and I can represent each bean as a 16 element vector, which lives in a 16 dimensional vector space. So obviously we can't visualize that, but what I wanna emphasize is that the principles that we can apply to two dimensional vector spaces translate directly to vector spaces with any number of dimensions. So now that we've covered vectors, matrices are actually pretty easy to understand. They're simply a collection of vectors from the same vector space. So we can see that here we have three of our two dimensional vectors. And because they come from the same vector space, you know, the first element represents the major axis length, the second, the minor axis length, they can live together in the same matrix. And if we bring that back to the data set concept, 
This matrix is conceptually equivalent to a data frame containing three bean data points with the two columns. So NumPy represents vectors and matrices in a data type called an array. And arrays unfortunately have their own concept of dimension, and that differs from how we've been discussing it in the context of linear algebra. The way that I find it easiest to think about dimensions of NumPy arrays is the number of sides in which they can change size. So let me show you this a bit more concretely. Vectors, you know, obviously they're going to be the first thing we look at. They're represented in a one-dimensional array. And that's because vectors only ever change size in terms of the number of elements that they contain. So you can see that here, the vectors are always going to have a size one in this direction, but they can have a size one to, you know, conceptually infinity in this direction. Um, arrays also have a property called shape, and this tells you the size of each dimension. So for this 1D array, we only have one value in our shape tuple, and that's the size two representing the number of elements in that vector or that 1D array. Matrices are unsurprisingly rep represented in two-dimensional arrays, and that's because we can have information both about the number of elements in each vector and also the number of vectors in the matrix, and that's then reflected in the shape tuple where you have two values. And then finally, a more complex concept in NumPy is that of n-dimensional arrays. So this is essentially where you reshape one or two-dimensional arrays so that they sit in a higher dimensional space. So you can see that here with this two-dimensional matrix here that I've now reshaped so it sits in a three-dimensional space. So the first dimension now represents the number of matrices, the second represents the number of vectors, and the third represents the number of elements in each vector. We're going to use this concept of three-dimensional or n-dimensional arrays a bit later on, so just hold on to this concept. And then let's go over briefly how k-nearest neighbors works. So a really useful property of vector spaces is that vectors that are close to each other tend to be similar, and those that are distant from each other tend to be dissimilar. It's pretty intuitive. So you can see that here in our vector space, we have beans that are the same color belonging to the same type, and they tend to be close to each other. And beans that are of different types tend to be far away from each other. So there are many, many different ways of measuring distance in vector spaces. But the one that I'm going to talk about today is one of the most basic ones. It's called the Manhattan distance. So to understand the Manhattan distance, the way that I find it easiest to understand is that imagine you're in a two-dimensional vector space and you're locked to only being able to travel along the X and Y axes to get between two points. So in this example, if I wanted to travel between this point B here and this point A here, I could travel two points here along the x-axis and then another two points here along the y-axis. And then I just add up the number of units that I traveled. So I traveled one, two, three, four units, and that gives me a total Manhattan distance of four. Now, of course, I don't want to do this manually every time I calculate it. So there is a way to do it computationally. You can just subtract your x values from your y values for each of the points take the absolute values of those and add them together. And that gives you the same result. And then of course, we can generalize that to a formula where the Manhattan distance formula tells us that we take the sum of all of the absolute differences of each pair wise element um, kind of matching up between the two vectors. So you can go all the way from, you know, taking the difference of the first elements, the second elements, all the way up to the end element. And again, I want to emphasize that you can see that although I've illustrated this again for two dimensions, you can apply this to vectors with any number of elements. So our 16, num uh, 16 element vectors are not going to be a problem here. So let's finally go over how k-nearest neighbors works. So first, we need to start with a data set. We're dealing with a machine learning problem after all. And we then divide that data set into two, a training data set and a test data set. We then take one of our test data sets, uh, data set points at a time, represented by this orange dot here, and we measure its pairwise distance between every single training point. So as you can probably guess, this gets a bit computationally expensive, especially as the size of your data set grows. Next, we sort every single training point by distance, and we retain the k nearest points to our test point. 
So K is um, usually a small number, generally between about three and 10. And then what we do is we get the labels of those nearest training points and we find out what is the most frequent one. And we then assign that to the test point. So this is how we work out what the most likely label is of that test point. We then repeat this exercise for every single test point in the data set. So again, this can be computationally expensive. So with that covered, we can now move on to creating our first implementation of the KNN algorithm. And we're gonna time how long it takes to run it with a few different samples of code to get that baseline. So let's jump over to PyCharm and see what that's going to look like. Okay, so let's have a look here at this first function. What we're doing is we're taking two vectors and trying to calculate the Manhattan distance between them. So we're passing in each vector as a list. And then what we do is we loop over every single element in that list. We take the difference between each element and apply the absolute value function to that. And then we sum up those differences to get the Manhattan distance for one pair of vectors. But we need to repeat this exercise to get every single pairwise distance between every training point and every test point. So this is what this function does. We pass in all of our training points and all of our test points as lists of lists. And then we use this uh, kind of intense looking nested for loop here to iterate over every combination of training observations and test observations and calculate that Manhattan distance between them. And what we end up with is a list of lists that contains all of those pairwise distances. Okay, so far so good. Now that we have these distances, we can find the most likely label for an individual test point. So what we have here is for an individual test point, we have the distances to every single one of the training points, and we have the labels of those training points. What we do is we zip those together to a list of lists, and what we end up doing is sorting that based on those distances to get you know, the most proximate points. And then what we do is we iterate through that list of lists in order to just extract the label for the top K points. And then finally, we need to apply this to every single one of the test points. So this is just a convenience function that bundles it all up and applies all of those calculations or all those functions to every single test point. Okay, so let's have a look at the data that we're going to be using. So as I said, we're going to be using this Beans data set. The Beans data set has around 27,000 observations and it has 16 feature columns. So that 17th column is just the labels. So we have 16 columns that we really need to deal with in terms of doing our calculations. And then what I've done is instead of just using the whole data set, I've created three different data sets to test out our calculations on or our functions on. So the first is a small data set. It has three feature columns and around 4,000 observations. We have the medium data set, which has the same three feature columns and all of the observations. So around 27,000 observations, and then the large data set, which just is the whole data set. So 16 feature columns and 27,000 observations. So the reason that I've done this is what I wanna see is the effect of making changes in the code on increasing the number of observations and also increasing the number of features. So we wanna see how both of these variables affect our code and then what happens when we vectorize certain parts of the code. So let's see how we did with the timing. So for the small data set, we're already doing pretty bad. We're taking 15 seconds for this tiny little data set. We're up to 12 minutes for the medium data set. And then we're already up to an eye-watering 40 minutes for the large data set. So what's going on here? The main difference in the time that it takes to run K nearest neighbors on the medium and the large samples comes from how we're calculating the distance between two vectors in that first function. So as I talked about, in order to calculate these distances, we loop over each of the vectors and we calculate the differences one by one. And as the large sample has 16 features and the medium sample only has three, we see a consequent scaling up in the computation time. So we're going to focus on getting rid of this for loop as our first improvement. We just need to cover a little bit more linear algebra first. So 
It's possible to do a number of arithmetic operations on vectors and matrices. These include addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And obviously for our purposes, subtraction is very interesting. So the way that it works is if you have two vectors or matrices of the same size, you can just line up all of the elements and you do that subtraction in one pass and you end up with a vector or matrix of the same size as the result. Something else you can do with vectors and matrices is apply operations to every element. So what this involves is passing that vector or matrix through a function and applying that function to every single element and getting a vector or matrix of the same size in return as with subtraction. So the most famous example of this, if you've read anything about linear algebra, is scalar multiplication. This is simply where you just multiply every element of the vector or matrix by a single number. But, you know, you can do anything. And for our purposes, you can definitely do absolute value um, element-wise uh, operations. So if we look at how this would work, let's say we have this matrix M, we pass that through an absolute value function, we apply the absolute value function to every element, and we end up with this matrix in return. So let's see how we can use this to improve our function to calculate that pairwise Manhattan distance and see if we can use that to get rid of our for loop. Okay, so let's have a look at this improvement. The first thing you're probably gonna notice is that instead of passing in A and B as lists, we're now passing them in as NumPy arrays. And what that means is in that line where we had that for loop, things look really different. In order to do that subtraction, we can now do it in one pass with this very elegant and readable subtraction notation. And then we just apply the NumPy absolute value function to that differences vector. We just sum up the results like we did previously, and that's it. That's the only change we've made. You can see how simple that is. And let's see what it did to our timings. So if we go down for our small data set, we're now down to around eight seconds. For the medium data set, we're down to about seven minutes. And the best improvement, as predicted, is for the large data set, we're now down to around nine minutes. So let's uh, have a look at how this was improved as a function of baseline. So around one point times, eight, uh, sorry, we're, we are around 1.8 times faster for the small and the medium data sets. And we've managed to get our large data set to be more than four times faster. So we've already managed to make some good performance gains in getting rid of these four loops. But we haven't made that much of a dent in the computation time for those smaller data sets. And the main culprit is that nested for loop that I showed you in the second function. The problem with nesting loops is once you start doing this, the number of operations you need to compute sequentially scales as a function of the product of the number of the elements in each of the two lists because what we're doing is we're creating permutations through every combination of each list. So that means that even with our tiny, tiny, small data set, we're running 3 million sequential operations to get those distances between each list. And with the medium and the large data sets, we're jumped up to 140 million sequential distance calculations. And if you think about it, this little beans data set is so tiny compared to many machine learning data sets. Like typically you're gonna have hundreds of thousands maybe millions of observations. So using nested for loops in these cases can really be prohibitively like time consuming. It's not really gonna be possible. So the second improvement is gonna focus on how we can get rid of this nested for loop. And to understand how we can do this, we just need to extend our knowledge of what we learned about vector operations with some tricks from NumPy. So let's start by imagining that we have these three vectors x, y, and z, and we want to find the pairwise differences between each of them. So this is obviously what we, we've been doing with the nested for loop so far. So let's start with trying to simplify things with getting the difference between each vector and the x vector. One way we can do this more efficiently than by looping is by combining all three vectors into a matrix. And remember, we can do that because they come from the same vector space. And then we can create two more copies of the x vector and combine that into a second matrix. And because everything lines up size-wise, we can just do that as a straight vector subtraction or matrix subtraction in this case, and we end up with the matrix containing all the differences. So this is a great improvement. But you're probably thinking to yourself, 
Well, we're going to need to loop in order to do the same exercise for the y and the z vectors, right? Well, we would if we were restricted to using 2D arrays like we have been so far. But as we know, fortunately, NumPy supports three-dimensional arrays, and this means we can actually do everything in one pass. So let's have a look at how this could work. Let's take our first matrix, that one that contains you know, one copy of each of X, Y, and Z, and let's have it first as a 2D array. But then let's cast it and reshape it to a 3D array. So we have one copy of that uh, matrix sitting in the first dimension. What we can then do is make two more copies, squish them together in the same 3D array, and we end up with a three by three by four array. We can do something similar with our uh, matrix containing three copies of the X vector. So we reshape that as well so that we have a 3D object with one copy sitting in the first dimension. And then we do the same thing with the X vector and the Y ve a Z vector, sorry, the, the Y vector and the Z vector. We squish them together in the same 3D array. And then we have, again, a three by three by four 3D array. So we can then just do a straightforward vector subtraction because every single element lines up along every dimension. It's all done in one pass. So we have an improvement in sort of time efficiency because we don't have to rely on this sequential processing anymore. But one problem you might have noticed is I've now introduced a memory inefficiency. I'm now replicating uh, arrays multiple times and having to store those in memory just to do these operations. And as the size of these arrays grows, that's going to come at a cost. Luckily, NumPy has another trick to help us out here, which is called broadcasting. This is essentially a memory efficient way for NumPy to do the sort of operation we just did without needing to explicitly replicate the vectors within the array. So the way that it works is if we want to do an operation with two arrays, NumPy will first compare them and check if they have the same number of dimensions. If so, it will then check whether the arrays have the same size in all dimensions. If so, then it's great. The operation can be carried out directly like we just did because the elements all line up. But if not, it will check whether one of the dimensions has a size of one. So it will check whether one of the arrays has a size of one for that dimension. And if that's the case, it then replicates the array along that dimension of size one until the sizes match up with the other array. So it's a bit confusing. So let me show you concretely how it would work with our little sample. So to start, we go back to this 2D array that we have, which contains one copy of X, one copy of Y, and one copy of Z. In the first example, the first case, we reshape it like we did last time. So we have one copy of this array sitting in the first dimension. Then what we do is we reshape it again. We create another copy so that we have one copy sitting in the second dimension. So we have two 3D arrays here, but they've been reshaped slightly differently. So what happens when we go to do this subtraction? Well, NumPy lines up the dimensions and checks the size of each. So for the last dimension, it's fine because it's the same size. And then what it can see is for the first dimension, we have a size of one in one of the arrays and three in the other. And for the other dimension, we have a size of three in one of the um, arrays and one in the other. So what it knows to do is for this first array, it will stretch it under the hood along the first dimension, doing that sort of, uh, doing implicitly that explicit replication that we did. And for the second array, it will stretch it along the second dimension. So then when you do the subtraction, you end up in return a three by three by four array containing all those differences, just like we did when we did it explicitly, but we don't need to explicitly create copies. So this saves us a lot of space in memory. So let's see how we can actually implement this in NumPy with the next code improvement. Okay. So we go to what was once our first and second uh, functions. We can see that we've made some huge changes. They no longer exist and I've consolidated them into one, uh, one function. So what you can see is now we're passing all of the training observations and all of the test observations to this function as 2D NumPy arrays. 
And then we come down to here, and this is where we do the subtraction, like we did with two, like a pair of vectors, but this time we're going to do all of the observations at once. So we do this reshaping that I talked about using this slicing notation. Where there is none, a size of one is set, and where we have these colons, the same dimension size is kept. So as you can see, I've got one in the first dimension for the train observations, one in the second dimension for the test observations. And so we can do that broadcast uh, subtraction and we end up with a 3D array containing all of the differences. Because this is just a matrix, uh, it might be a 3D um, one, but it's still a matrix. We can apply that NumPy absolute value operation to it. And then we sum it along the third dimension. So we end up with a 2D array containing all of those differences. And that's the change. So let's see what it's done to our time efficiency. We're down to one and a half seconds for the small sample. We're down to one minute for the medium sample. And we're down to three minutes for the large sample. So you can see that we've made some pretty good changes. If we have a look at this as a function of the baseline time, you can see we're now between 10 and 13 times faster. So we've really done a lot of good work, but the thing is, that all of the like, changes that we've done so far have been just to the distance calculation. And there's still quite a lot of the code that's left in loops and lists when it comes to calculating those nearest neighbors. So let's see how we can gain some speed here. So let's have a look at our third function, or what used to be our third function for calculating a test point's nearest neighbors. So there's a couple of quite expensive operations here. The most expensive operation here is where we're sorting the entire training set. And then we have also here a list comprehension where we loop through every observation in the training set in order to get the top K labels. So why are these problems? Well, sorting lists in Python is locked into one sorting algorithm called TimSort. In contrast, NumPy sort and argsort have a bit more flexibility. So for example, if you do not select a method for sorting, NumPy will default, default to the faster quick sort. And even when you need stable sorting, the algorithm that NumPy uses can be adjusted for the data type of the array because NumPy arrays always contain the same data type. So they have the ability to do this. And then apart from the sorting, from the sorting we have one final function, uh, issue with this function, which is that sneaky list comprehension. So in some cases, list comprehensions can basically function as for loops by another name. So this is likely causing us another bottleneck. So let's have a look at our final code and see how we can get rid of these. Okay, so if we come down to this function, what you can now see is, again, instead of passing in the distances and the labels as lists, we're passing them in as one-dimensional NumPy arrays. What we then do is we combine them into a two-dimensional array using this vstack method. And then this line is where the magic happens. So what we do is we sort based on the column that contains the distances. We keep the top K, and then we use this slicing notation to slice back off that 1D array, which contains the labels. So instead of having to iterate through you know, a list of lists, we can simply just take the column that we need. And that's it. Let's see how our final timings have gone. So we're down to 12.7 milliseconds for the small data set, 15 seconds for the medium, and two and a half minutes for the large. And if we look at that as a function of baseline, we are 15 times faster for the large data set 50 times larger for the medium and over 1,000 times larger for the small data set. And while these gains might seem quite impressive, from reading around on this topic, I have seen similar gains from basically everything I've read where people have implemented these vectorized operations rather than loops. So, you know, you should be able to expect similar gains for your own code. So the final thing I wanted to talk about just to wrap up this talk is why it's faster to use arrays rather than lists. So I was really confused <laughs> when I first started playing around with this. I couldn't really understand where these time gains were coming from. So hopefully this will give you an intuition for why it's actually faster to use arrays sometimes rather than 
lists and why you know looping can be so expensive. So let's say we've created a variable A, um, either in a Jupyter notebook or in a script, and that variable is going to have an address in memory. And then let's say we create another variable C in the same program or the same notebook, and it will also have its own address in memory. But as you can see in this illustration, these memory addresses may not be sequential. They may not even be close to one another. So memory is really massive. So it's divided into blocks called pages. You can kind of think of pages like postcodes in the UK. Um, not sure if you guys are familiar with these, but basically postcodes in the UK refer to a small number of addresses. So my sister lives in the UK and her postcode includes her house and around five of her neighbors. And this page division is designed to make memory easier to work with in exactly the same way that postcodes make it easier for the Royal Mail to deliver letters in theory. So the thing is that the CPU is really lazy and it won't do operations with variables unless they're physical, physically close to it. So this means that if I wanted to do an operation with A, the entire page that A is located on will be physically moved right next to the CPU so that that operation can be completed. So this is kind of akin to if the post office needed to move my sister's house and all of her neighbors right next to the post office just to deliver a package to her. Although I would hope it's a little easier to move pages rather than houses. So what does this look like with lists? So let's say we created this list here with five elements. How will this be stored in memory? So unlike what you might expect, because this is what I expected when I first started learning about how these things are stored, each element of the list is not actually stored in the same area of memory. And I've made it a kind of extreme example, but elements of lists may not even be stored on the same page. So in this case, we have five different elements on five different pages. So what happens when we try to loop over this operation to do, uh, loop over this list to do an operation on every element? So this happens. You can see for every element, the entire page needed to be moved to the location next to the CPU. And each page is around four kilobytes. So this means that for every element in the list, four kilobytes of memory is being moved. So as you can imagine, this is the main thing that makes looping over a list so slow. There are some additional things though that make it slower. Because lists allow mixed data types in contrast to arrays, the Python interpreter must check the data type of every element before running this operation. And that involves doing a number of checks, including seeing whether the operation that you want to perform on the element is even valid. So, you know, let's say you've got a list with mixed integers and substrings, uh, sorry, mixed, mixed integers and strings. If you try to run a substring operation, it's obviously going to be invalid when it reaches the integer elements. And the interpreter needs to do that so it can throw an error. So in contrast, let's look at what happens with arrays. Let's say I create this NumPy array here. It has the exact same elements, the same information as the list, but it's stored as an array rather than a list. So each element in this array will be stored next to each other, meaning that the whole array is stored in a contiguous block of memory. So there's now a good chance that the elements of a matrix that I create or a large vector are going to be spread over just a few pages. And that cuts down on the number of pages that need to be moved to run my operation over the whole array. And then because arrays are locked to a single data type, it makes a few things easier. It means that the interpreter doesn't need to do those checks to see whether the operation is valid, but it also means that it's much easier to subset the array using indexing because data types have a fixed number of bytes that they operate, uh, occupy. And then finally, certain NumPy operations can be parallel, uh, parallelized using a type of processing called SIMD or single instruction multiple data. So this means that the data within an array can be broken into blocks and some operations can be run over each in parallel. And this obviously adds another speed boost compared to entirely sequential processing that you're locked into when you're using loops. So that is it. Um, I hope this gave you a good grounding on why NumPy's vectorized operations work the way they do and when and where it can be helpful to apply them. If you want to reach out to me, my details are here. So I'm the most active on Twitter and my handle is here. I'm less active on Mastodon, but I'm also there. And please feel free to reach out if that's your preferred platform. 
And I also have a blog, which I've maintained for quite a number of years now. Um, there's actually a series on my blog, which goes into a lot of detail about this topic. So please feel free to visit the blog if you're interested. And then finally, if you want to play with the notebooks that I created and used in this talk, please follow this QR code. It will take you straight to the GitHub repo and you can uh, fork that and play with those notebooks. Thanks. Hello again, Julie. Thank you, Jody. So thank you so much for the talk. <laughs> no problem. Was 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 nice listening to you. So I would say we jump into a quick Q&A if that works for you. And yeah. so to the audience, this is the chance now to submit your questions if you haven't done it already. And also to kick it off with you, Jody. Um, very interesting career. You started out with um, studying clinical psychology and biostatistics and ended up in data science. Maybe do you want to enlighten us a bit about your developer journey, how you got interested in tech and yeah, how, how you became what you are now? <laughs> I, I get this question a lot um, because I think it's, it's quite an unusual background. Um, yeah, so... I trained in Australia, you can probably tell from the accent. Um, and when I was going through my undergraduate um, psychology, psychology in Australia is taught as a behavioral science. So it's extremely heavy on statistics. And um, unlike other psychologists, I fell in love with statistics. So it was my favorite part really of <laughs> being a psychologist. Um, so when I finished my PhD, I was like, I don't actually want to do like academic psychology, I would prefer to move into something more statistically focused. So yeah, I got a job doing a biostatistics bio postdoc and then decided academia wasn't for me, done a lot of career changes. And that's sort of how I got into data science. Um, during my PhD, I taught myself to code in Python. Um, you know, there's always some urgent thing that you need to learn rather, that's, rather than doing your thesis. So that was how that came about. Um, but I really fell in love with programming and I think that's a real strength of Python, that it's so approachable, it's so friendly. And this is sort of something that I want to kind of emphasize from my talk that there's nothing wrong with using loops and lists. They're great for beginners, but when you do need to be slightly more efficient, there are tools in Python to actually help you. So yeah, that's kind of how I came to <laughs> be a data scientist from a psychologist. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you also get a lot of love in the comments. Love how visual oh. the presentation was, for example. <laughs> so, and um, question from the community. What does NumPy actually do? Uh, is it not performing the same loops in compiled C core? So we are kind of bypassing not loops rather than Python loops, don't we? Yes, this is such a great question because this was the question I had. And yeah, I probably should tweak the presentation to make it a bit more clear. So you are doing loops in, in C code. I actually went and had a look at the, the source code for how the absolute value function is implemented. And yes, it is a loop. The difference really is that firstly, you can have this simmed processing. So you can parallelize it. So it's not strictly sequential but it's also the fact that you don't need to move so much, uh, so many blocks of memory in order to do those operations. So the hugest time saving is not necessarily that it's not sequential. It's the fact that you don't need to move so many, so much, um, like so much stuff in memory to do the operation. Right, thank you Jody for that answer. Mm -hmm. um, next question. The problem in KeyNN is how many clusters we choose. So we most use cost function to decide that problem. Yeah, mm. we must use cost function to decide that problem. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, the question is, yeah. It's, so this, yeah. yeah, this really just comes about through hyperparameter tuning. Like it's, it, it's completely subjective how many fun like clusters you use. Um, and obviously the number of clusters you use can drastically affect your results. Um, my experience with KNN is like with all machine learning algorithms, you start getting a bit of an intuition over time. So you start realizing, okay, this data is fairly well separated. So 
it's not going to require as much evidence in order to get a reliable label. Whereas if you have data that's not particularly well separated, obviously the neighbors are going to be more mixed. So you're going to need like a larger number of K, but you will like, you will do this with hyperparameter tuning. So But yeah, thank you for answering. Also, this question, the next one um, would be, is it possible to demonstrate how 3D array is stored in memory? Uh, demonstrate in what sense? Like, oh, like um, in terms of the little demonstration I did with the, um, yes, yes, I understand what you mean. Um, yeah, I don't really know like, <laughs> I guess like it would essentially be a three-dimensional um, like memory storage. Um, I do confess I'm not a huge expert on system internals, so I'm not really sure exactly how that problem is solved. Um, but yeah, it, it has to be contiguous. And this was actually, I'm kind of answering one of my own questions, but something that you might have noticed and it really surprised me when I was putting the talk together is it was much, much, um, or the, the performance gains we got for uh, the small data set were much, much bigger than for the larger data sets. And I didn't really understand why this is the case. My theory is actually, you remember when we do the broadcasted subtraction um, operation, in the end, you still end up with a gigantic 3D array, which contains all those differences before you do the sum and you collapse it back to a 2D array. So my theory is that we actually need to find space in memory to store that entire thing contiguously. So yeah, I think that's actually adding quite a lot of cost. And this was sort of a point I wanted to make if anyone asked this question, but I'm asking it myself, is um, there will be times where actually doing operations that result in gigantic arrays that need to be stored somewhere may actually be more costly so you kind of need to play around with it and, and time it and see whether it's actually going to be worth it. Um, the other thing you can do, sorry, this is a topic I like so much. The other thing you can do is in, uh, say, like scikit-learn, they don't actually calculate every single one of the pairwise differences. Um, so instead, they use uh, approximate nearest neighbors technique. And this means that instead of knowing exactly the distance between every single training point in say 16 dimensions or 30 dimensions or hundred dimensions, you can estimate it in a lower dimensional space, like two or one dimensions. And this gives you a good idea of how far away things are from each other, what the approximate nearest neighbors are without needing to do like those exact calculations in like a hundred dimensions and then store all of that and then process that. So yeah, it's really interesting uh, kind of how far down this optimization path you can go. Yeah, thanks for this as well. And there is uh, always room also for your FAQ. So um, since, since yeah. you are uh, the, the expert in this topic, you obviously got more questions than we have in during this talk. So feel free to just answer everything that no. comes also to your mind. No, it's all good. <laughs> uh, so next question, actually, um, mm -hmm. it seems very inefficient to calculate every pairwise difference. Is there a faster way to do it? Yeah, exactly. So this was exactly what yeah. I was talking about. So I can go into a little bit more detail about the approximate nearest neighbors um, algorithm I've used in the past, actually in production. So the problem we were trying to solve was we were dealing with word embeddings and I was working at a job board um, in Germany. And what we wanted to do was when someone typed in a search term for say a job title, we wanted to expand their search term at search time to related skills or vice versa. If they type in a skill, we want to expand it to job titles. So we worked out basically like, you know, the most closely related skills and job titles using word embeddings, but that left us with you know, these 100 dimension vectors and actually finding the closest uh, vectors at search time was really, really expensive. So what we did was we used approximate nearest neighbors and 
just to kind of go into the technical details a little bit, but it doesn't really matter. Um, essentially, you can take these 100 dimension vectors, you can generate another vector, which just contains random values from a certain distribution, multiply them together. And because it's a dot product, which is another linear algebra um, operation you can do, you end up with a single number. So you basically collapse a 100 dimension vector to a one dimensional space. And then that just means you can, you know, create a hash table and you just divide them into hash bins and you just search within that hash bin. So it's really interesting the sort of stuff you can do. Um, you can get pretty good approximations for like high dimensional spaces, but you obviously lose a little bit of information. Right. Thank you for elaborating also on this topic. Um, maybe really quick to the audience, since there are a lot of questions in the chat, um, it would be uh, best if you use the ask button uh, beneath the chat, because this way I'm, you can make sure that I'm not missing any question and <laughs> it will get answered by Jody. So <laughs> it's in your personal interest. But yeah, uh, next question would be, does the large continuous NumPy data set you, uses more resources to move the page? I don't know. This is a good question. Um, as I understand it, whatever is stored on the page, because I don't think the pages are necessarily empty. So there may be other things stored in memory which are not related to your Python program. Um, so potentially, you know, I can't, again, not a systems person, can't take, talk about that in a lot of detail, but um, I don't think necessarily that you're just moving the things that you've created in your Python program. There are probably other things on that page as well. Great. Thank you, Jody. Um, next question. What if we use number instead of NumPy to compile the loops to C as NumPy does? Would it provide comparable speeds? Mm. Now, I'm not entirely sure what number's doing under the hood, but again, I think it would depend if it stores it continuously. So if it's in a contiguous block of memory, that's where the gains are going to come from. But of course, um, applying C is going to be a bit faster. Although I'm pretty sure that quite a lot of operations like base Python operations already use C. So again, I don't think this is entirely where the gains are coming from. All right, thanks, Jody. Uh, the next question is actually a question I was waiting for because every time <laughs> we have a developer advocate here, this question comes up. Uh, first, uh, kudos because thanks for the talk. <laughs> What Thank is you. a developer advocate? Could you please elaborate on your own? <laughs> This is also a great question. <laughs> so yeah. we, we get it a lot, lot of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you heard already about my earlier career. So I worked for around six years as a data scientist. My last job, I got up to lead data scientist. So I'd been working in quite a lot of different, um, you know, areas and the developer advocate job came up because, uh, like a friend of mine also works as a developer advocate at JetBrains, but in .NET. And she suggested that I apply for the role. So... Initially, I wasn't sure about applying for this job because I didn't know what a developer advocate was. And I thought that it was more like a marketing position. Um, there's a lot of confusion. <laughs> But at JetBrains, at least, the way that we define developer advocates is we're a liaison between the technical community that we represent and the company. So it's basically a way of making sure that the tools that we're building are relevant for the company. And I think this is the same with many other companies. So my job is basically to go out, listen to people, hear what challenges they're having in data science, um, you know, chat with them about stuff from my own experience, take that back to the company and say, hey, like our tools are not meeting this need, um, push for changes based on my own experience. But then also like if I think the tools are a good fit, they're not always going to be. I will recommend them to help people solve specific problems. So yeah, like it's definitely not a sales position, definitely not marketing. Um, we do work with those departments, but the main goal is to be like the, the advocate for the community within the organization. And that's the most important part of my job. Yeah, thanks also for this answer. I think every company has a slightly different definition of developer advocate but so it's always very interesting 
um, what the, the small differences are. <laughs> so really, yeah. really thanks for that. <laughs> um, we got another question, uh, data centric or model centric? Mm, so I'm guessing what <laughs> I'm going to translate this question. I'm sorry if I don't translate correctly, but I'm guessing you're sort of saying, is it more important to have good data or is it more important to have a good model? Now, you're probably going to guess with my background, the answer is going to be data. Um, but let me explain why. And let me explain where it's not always black and white. So basically my background, we spent so much time learning how to measure things and learning how to clean up data in order to get like unbiased, reliable results. Bad reputation that psychology does have aside for being really bad <laughs> at like reproducing things, at least in my training, we really had like a very rigorous education in um, preparing data. So for me, like if you have data that does not have a signal, like you, there's no story that that data can tell you, or you haven't sampled properly, or you haven't prepared the data properly in some way, you, you cannot salvage that with a model. There is no model in the world that will get a signal where there is none. But um, I spent a lot of my career in NLP, as you probably guessed from that uh, story I told you about working at the job board. And like, I think maybe transformer models, particularly GPT models, are a little bit of maybe an exception to the rule. It's not really, it's, it's more like a collaboration between the two. So I was around when, you know, word to vec was like, you know, word embeddings were the hot technology we were using in production. And, um, you know, basically... This, this sort of like, we had this conception that in order to get good performance out of models, we were going to have to, you know, hand code ontologies or hand code relationships between words or definitions or, you know, store all this in a database and that would be the meaningful data. But because of the invention of these transformer-based architectures, because with GPT models, you can basically use unsupervised data not for the, you know, the chat GPT models with the reinforcement learning, but, you know, your base GPT models. Um, it is kind of a case where having massive, massive, massive data sets, not necessarily super well curated, can actually get you very compelling and amazing results. Although there is still bias and toxicity in these models. So <laughs> there is still some problems. So anyway, that was actually a massive soapbox. I, that was, that's a question I really liked. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Jody. Um, hopefully you like the next question also as much, um, because I think it's, it's also a really nice one. Uh, how would you start learning data science in 2023, knowing what you know now? Yeah, so this is, this is such a nice question, actually. Um, I, it was funny, when I first left academia, I had a lot of regrets about the degree that I'd studied. I was like, oh my God, why didn't I study statistics or physics or machine learning or something? Um, although machine learning PhDs weren't really a thing when I was graduating. Um, I think what I would sort of uh, first tell myself is like a mindset thing. Like it is overwhelming. There is a massive amount of stuff you can learn. And I think AI hype has made it feel even more intimidating. Um, But I would sort of, I guess, start with the fundamentals. So there are some fundamentals you need to just understand with data preparation. There are fundamentals you need to understand with um, statistics, but you don't need to know that much. You just need to know the real basics. I would advise anyone starting, just, just really learn the internals of a couple of very fundamental models. I would say linear and logistic regression and decision trees, just understand how they work because they will actually get you a lot of the way to really understanding the intuition of how machine learning models work with data. And then I would say just pick one, Python or R. Um, I think the use case really depends on the sort of jobs you're looking for. If you're looking for more statistics-based, maybe academic jobs, R is probably going to be your best bet, although I do know it's used in production. If you're more interested in maybe bridging um, data science and like productionizing machine learning more, definitely go for Python. But just 
there's really no wrong choice. Just start with the basics. Um, Python is very friendly to learn. R is not too bad either. Um, and yeah. Oh, and learn SQL. Do definitely learn that. But and just take it one step at a time. It's it's hugely overwhelming, but you do not need to learn neural nets until quite a long way into your career. And very few people use them in production. I think the last point is very important because people tend to get frustrated when they want to really shoot over their heads too early. And then it's it's not quite fun if you're not succeeding and really step after Ex step. <laughs> exactly. Do we have time for one yes. more maybe? Yes, we have time for one more question. And yeah, we actually got one. When, uh, when should you not use NumPy? Any example for that maybe? That's yeah, not a good idea. So I, I would say a um, couple of cases. We've already talked about like maybe you really are going to run into a problem storing massive arrays. But I would say um, there's some very exciting stuff happening with pandas. So as you guys know or may know, pandas is under the hood or previous versions of pandas were based on NumPy and Pandas 2 actually just got released and it's now based on Arrow or Pi Arrow. And it's a completely different way of processing data. Um, there's actually going to be a lot of speed efficiencies, different ways of dealing with missing data. So if you're interested, I would actually delve into like the, the stuff that's been written about the changes to um, Pandas 2. And yeah, I think this is a really good illustration of when maybe NumPy is not the best library versus something else. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jody. We sadly run out of time. If you've got yes. more questions to Jody, reach out. She shared her socials. Um, we can also post them again in the chat if you just uh, sent them to us in the private chat, Jody. So yep. everybody has access to them. Or we're sharing again the, the QR codes. So five, mm -hmm. four, three, two, one. <laughs> All right, Jody, thank you so much for the awesome talk. You got a lot of love from the community also today. So keep up your presentation style. It's, it's really nice. And yeah, hopefully see you soon on the next live day. Have a nice day. Bye. Yeah. Bye. All right. And before we go on to the next speaker of the day, just a quick 20 second break. Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now. And we are going right back to Python. The next speaker of today is backend SER at Goldcast. His developer journey started with freelancing, like so many other, and he actually um, participated and won quite a few hackathons with one of his biggest wins would be the Smart India Hackathon 2019. So kudos for that and welcome KD. Hey everyone. Hello KD. So happy that you joined us today. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine also. Thanks so much. So, Katie, before we jump into your se uh, session, would you mind sharing a bit with me and the audience what we are going to learn from you today? Sure. So, yes, so, so today I will be talking about uh, Django mostly. Uh, when I say Django, not only any particular uh, vanilla Django, but I will be talking about how we can use Django for uh, uh, using it as a REST API source. Nowadays, uh, REST APIs are like, you know, uh, a good standard of making APIs. So I'll be talking about how we can use Django to make REST APIs in general. Amazing, Katie. Thanks for sharing that with us. And without further ado, stage is all yours. Hi, folks. Uh, Katie here. Uh, and today, as you already know, we'll be talking about how to make REST APIs in, in Django in general. Okay. So a bit about me, uh, what I have been doing. Uh, I'm a full stack developer. Uh, lately, I was working with uh, with, a, with with a startup Goldcast. Uh, currently, I will be joining a different one. And before uh, joining before uh, joining it as an employee, I was uh, working with my own startup. And uh, I, I failed it. And now I'm starting an engineer. Right? So yeah, let's uh, jump straight to the topic for the day. 
that is uh, rest apis right? as you talked about that we'll be talking about building rest apis in general right so the first question that comes to our mind is basically what are uh, what are rest endpoints right? you know is it a framework is it a library which we can just like you know, use and probably like you know write apis in any programming language or something uh, and by many people feel like it is a library that we have to use in order to make uh, rest apis and that's why they are called rest apis but yeah uh we'll be talking about it uh, they are not actually that right so what are uh, what what are rest apis in the rest apis are basically a way of defining apis right? it is a it is a standardizing or you can say it more like it is a way of uh, like a few people said together and what they said what okay let's define some like you no know, guidelines on how we should make an api right uh, earlier people used to make apis in whatever way they wanted to and uh, that's how it was going for some time but lately they started thinking that it becomes a bit uh, like you know uh, pain for the front end developers be it like you know web developers who are working on making web application or the mobile application developers in order to integrate those apis uh, you know with with, with uh, their respective clients and all right if we don't have a standardized uh, set of apis which we can use right it becomes very complex to uh, like you know work with uh, the uh, work, work with the apis in general so Yeah, uh, I will be talking with an example, right? You know, let, let's take, take an example of, uh, like, you know, let's take the, uh, let, let's say the resource that we're trying to work is, uh, let's say we have a node making application and we want to make REST APIs for it, right? So I'll be, um, uh, currently I'm talking about REST APIs. I'm not talking in general anything related to general stuff because REST APIs are something. These are a set of guidelines, right? So you, you can implement the, we can follow these guidelines and make REST APIs, REST APIs in whatever language you want to do, okay? So yeah, uh, uh, we will be taking an example of uh, notes as of now, uh, right? Notes as in the notes that we make on uh, that that we make on uh, like you no know, for for our personal uses. For example, we uh, uh, we we are attending a lecture, right? We want to make notes for it, and for whatever reason. So I'm not I'm talking about those kind of notes in general. Okay. So yeah. So uh, again, uh, when when I say we want to make nodes or like you no know, node creation application, there might be few cases. There might be few things that we want to create in general, right? That may be let, let's consider uh, from the user's perspective. What will be those kind of uh, like you no? Know, uh, what will be those use cases for which we'll be using those APIs? First of all, we would want to see list of nodes that we have, right? In general, like uh, for all the nodes that we have set till now, we would want that those nodes uh, should be present over there. We would we would we should be able to create a a specific new node if we want to. We should be able to update any existing node. Like we can just open any of the previous nodes and like you know, we can start adding things and it should just update in general. Right? Or maybe if we want to uh, delete those nodes, for example, we saw okay uh, it was a gibberish thing and we don't want to keep it uh, anymore. So we can just delete those nodes in general. Right? So all these operations will be performed. Th these are the basic operations that we do in general in uh, when when we work with anything. We call this CRUD operation. Uh, we call this CRUD operations, like create, treat, update, and delete operation that we have to perform in general. And in REST APIs, we usually want to like you no know, cater for this case where we are creating uh, uh, where we are creating uh, like you no know, REST endpoints, which will basically look for these things. Okay. So yeah, uh, as I was, as I was talking about, uh, first use case that would have is uh, probably for listing nodes in general, right? So as I uh, as I was say, saying. uh rest apis are basically set of guidelines on how we should write endpoints in general okay it is nothing else it is just uh, just a guideline which says that we want to create certain kind of endpoints for specific use cases we just have to make sure that uh, we are following this guideline and that, that's all we uh, that's all we have to do in general so for example when i say uh, i want to create an endpoint that will work with a resource that is no that, that is basically a node so the guideline says that what uh, the endpoint should always uh, be plural right so you, you can say that it is not a, uh, in the in the endpoint it will never be node slash node it will not, never be noted right? rather what it will be it will be slash node uh, we have to make it plural in general that, that is what the guideline says and uh, the get here represent the like you not know, the type of request that we have to make for this specific endpoint right so for example if i have to list all the nodes i just have to make a get request for this endpoint and that would mean that i want to list all the nodes that i have and that's how to know for uh, listing nodes in there okay the next use case will be to uh, get a specific node right in the previous example we got some nodes and like you know we want to get uh, get a very specific node that we wanted to try because uh, in the previous endpoint on the get slash nodes endpoint it will give us an array of all the nodes that we have 
and we just have to copy the id of the node that we want to see and again uh, we just have to append the id in this specific node endpoint and again the method will again be uh, get method and you know that's how we we say if you want to get specific resource we just pass uh, here some unique thing that uh, the different uh, that differentiate the, that specific object from the rest of the like you know, nodes in general okay so if you have to get a list of all the nodes we just uh, so uh, we just uh, hit slash nodes if you have to get a specific node we do slash nodes and then we pass some unique thing it can be id it can be slug or it can be anything but it should be something that basically you that uniquely identifies a specific object in general okay likewise let's say uh, we want to create a node right again the endpoint will be similar the endpoint will be no, not similar the endpoint will be same just that the mode of the request will be changed right earlier if you remember when we wanted to list the nodes we, we what we were doing was we were uh, making get request to slash nodes right now what we are trying to do is we are uh, making a post request and the same endpoint right so now the type of request that we make uh makes a difference like you know it differentiates between everything in jira so if you want to create a node we just uh, like you know hit a post uh, request uh, on the same endpoint and it would mean that we want to create a specific node likewise uh, if you want to like you know update a specific node completely uh, i will uh, tell you about the complete update and and, and partial update thing you know, we have two methods for updating a specific node obviously uh, this is the same endpoint that we were using but the method was get if you wanted to get a specific node if you want to update it completely update as in like you no know, uh, if we are making a put request we have to send all the request bodies and uh, uh, we have to send the, all the like you no know, the full request body in the request and that will have the update given so basically put request means whatever we are getting in the request body should be replaced should, should basically replace everything that is there for this specific object right so if i had to if i had to fill say, let's say like you no know, name and, and name and detail uh, or maybe title or detail of the node that we we were updating if i am making a put request we have to pass those two keys for sure right that that then only will uh, basically like you no know, replace it completely in general like we as we also have another uh, uh, method of like you no know, updating this thing that is the patch method uh, we call it partial update partial update is in we only send the field that we want to update for example in the notes if we have title and description if you if you are only updating the title field then we make a post uh, then then we make a patch request and we only send the that the new title that we want to update the rest body will remain as it is right that's how we know that we want to update the single thing and it makes the request lighter as well right? uh, the smaller request body that mean that the request will be faster for faster and so then point if you remember then point still the same we are just playing with the like you no know, request type that that we have in jenny likewise if you want to delete an endpoint we have to then point will again remain the same just that the the, the request type will change from uh, it will change to delete we have a, uh, we have a method called delete so now we have to make an http uh, http request with method delete for this specific endpoint that's how the server will know that now uh, like now we have to delete that specific and uh, whatever i had talked about in in like now in, in past few minutes is basically a rest, uh, is basically this uh, these are known as rest, rest apis right these are the guidelines that basically we have to follow when we are trying to make rest apis in jenny okay yeah so now uh, jumping to the uh, uh, jumping to the core topic of today is how to build rest apis in in, in jenny in general right so again we all the uh, all the uh, all the specification that i talked about in a few minutes ago we can implement those things as it is like we can just literally code ourselves uh, we can implement all those parts uh, uh, ourselves and yeah we can uh, we, we can obviously do it but there is an easier way of doing it right uh, easier way as in uh, there is a standard way like, like basically it follows the whole standard uh, uh, standard practices that should be followed in rest and at the same time uh the number of code that we write in general becomes very very less and we can reuse like you know this library for uh, making rest and point for almost all of the resources on on or on our on our backend in general right so yeah that's why we will be using this django rest framework django rest framework is a like you know library for uh, django project and with with this thing we can like you know literally make uh, rest apis in django in a span of few minutes right i will show you i will show you how we can uh, use those things to actually make it right So yeah, uh, before we jump into it, uh, we will be we'll talking about like you know the core concept that we'll be focusing on today. Ah, uh, when we talk about like you know, ah, uh, using Django REST API, there are few things that Django REST API, ah, uh, Django REST framework package offers us. That is, the first thing is serialization, the second is routers, the third is view set, and the fourth is authentication permission set. Right? I'll be talking about uh, all of them serially. Ah, uh, first of all, will be serialization, right? So, ah, uh, we might all be aware about the world of serialization in any programming, right? 
basically we want to uh, like you know represent the data in a specific format when we want to serialize it. for example we might have a python object but when we serialize it let's say we want to respond it in a json format so we serialize it we serialize the data that we have on the database to a specific json format and that the, the process of doing it is called serialization okay and then again the deserialization is just the reverse order, right likewise we we have a we have a key uh, term that we will be using uh, today it is routers right what what, what routers so you might be aware like you know, when whenever we make uh, any request to uh, like to any of the backend servers right we have a combination of like you know as uh, when i was talking about rest apis uh, it generally i was talking about get get request put post request put request patch request get request and then i was uh, combining those uh, request methods with a specific uh, route right routes is in the endpoints where we will be like you know making an api call right so these routers are basically those endpoints right those com the combination of that request method and the endpoint is what we uh, do when we define a, when we define a router in general okay like what you said uh, so where, when we say that we have defined a router we have to attach it to something right uh, because in be it like you know, in any of the modern web frameworks be it like you know, mvp or uh, be it uh, mvt django follows mvt right uh, mvc is model view uh, controller and django follows uh, model view and template in general right so whenever we uh, whenever we de define some routers uh, we what we do is uh, we uh, we make it pay, again we make a pair of uh, those routers uh, those those routes with with uh, with a combination of like you no know, uh, either some class based uh, some class based views or some function based views in general those are basically python function and python classes that we attach with the routes that that's how uh, the that's how the django knows okay if if we're getting a request on this endpoint we i had to point that request to this specific like you no know, views on the code and that's how it works right so yeah uh, when i say view sets uh, uh, i'm talking about uh, a collection of such endpoints which i can club together and like and i can uh, i can like you not know, attach it with routes in general and yeah that's how uh, uh, we will be looking at that as well then the last point is authentication and permission side so authentication is a very a very important part when when we work with backend in general right whenever we, work, we are working with backend <clears throat> whenever we, we are, whenever we are making an api authentication uh, i have just written authentication but authentication and authorization are two such points which are like you know very very important for us along with the permission uh, uh, the permission basically in, i mean i was talking about the authorization part right those uh, usually people uh, think that those are the uh, the two things those are the two, two similar things because of the this similarity in how they spell it authentication and authorization but those those are two different things in general authentication basically means that like you know uh, when when we when we log into an application basically we, what we do is we are trying to authenticate you whether you are a genuine user or not right when we are trying to authorize you we know that you are a genuine user but whether you have those uh, like you know, privileged permissions to access those resources or not right that is what we are trying to do yeah so those are uh, when we uh, when we talk about like you know creating rest api these are the four important aspects uh, to look at right first is the data serialization uh, how we are going to like you know serialize the data to uh, in the responses be it json or xml now the json is used mostly so we will be talking mostly about the json and all the second uh, the second point is like you know, how we define the endpoints right i just told you how we define uh, how a rest endpoint should be likewise the view sets we'll be talking about a bit later as we progress in, uh, in, in, in the session and the third part again author authentication and authorization right how we can do those authentication and authorization thing in in django uh, when we are uh, like you know, making rest apis at the same time we we won't be implementing everything on our own we will be using a very good and very reliable library in django that is known as django rest framework and we'll be in short it is also known as drf and we'll be using it to uh, make rest apis today okay so yeah uh, serialization I, as i was talking about and serialization when we say serialization uh, uh, there are two things that you should remember the first thing is that we have to serialize the data that is there in the raw format to a, to a representable format right? when i say representable format what i mean is basically like you no know, we want to work with the uh, Uh, for example in 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 our case it is usually a json that we want to play with or if you say in python it is a uh, similar equivalent of json are like no dictionary in general right so yeah uh, when we talk about dictionary uh, when we talk about serialization uh, we you, at most of the times we what we mean is we want to serialize some, some of the data that is there in the uh, database itself right so yeah uh, the the two things so firstly like you no know, we can either uh, serialize a dictionary python dictionary To, 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 to json which you can do without uh, using drf as well 
but the second part is again like you know, stylizing the model object from your model object to a representable um, uh, json object in general right that is one what you want to do again this is also something that we can do on our own but uh, using drf in general like you know makes us uh, uh like you know avoid all the like you know pitfalls that we might call it because it is a very mature plugin that has been that has been around uh like you know that has been there around for like for, for a lot of years now for for uh, for, uh, for past couple of couple of years right so yeah we we say don't don't uh don't reinvent something that is already there right so yeah, that's why we want to just use it and uh like you know, uh, make a use of it so yeah uh in this context in co in the context of making aps uh, we will uh, like you know fetch data from the database and then we will be uh, like you know, responding it as as json to any of the api client that will be trying to consume the api right so yeah how do we do it right let's uh, let's take a jump, uh, let's take a look at the code uh, right for example let's say this is a simple this is a very simple model uh, that that we have here right we have a task model uh, this is again this is django model that that we have and we have defined a model here right uh, in the model we have a title and then we have a boolean right uh, so yeah uh, like the title field that uh, since it is task uh, a title field is there and then the a completed field is there which is basically a boolean right now we want to serialize it so in the database we will have a table where like you no know, where we will have a field uh, such as id title and completed and, and then like you know, we will have those data uh, in a uh, in the raw format what we want to do is we want to use this model to again generate is equivalent serialized uh, serialized data uh, when i say serialized data I, I mean in this one it should return uh, the title should be a string field and at the same time the template should be a boolean field right we should return true false in json not not string true false but literal true false of json how we return true false in, in json right we want to uh, convert those uh, model uh, to an equivalent serialized so that uh, whenever you want to respond we just pass the uh, like you know, query set or we just pass the database instance and it, it the serializer should do the job right and so how can we do it yeah, we what we don't need to uh, do a lot of things we just need to define the uh, this is a very equivalent uh, this is a very simple code for defining the right? uh, we are just importing rest uh, framework we are importing the serializers and there we are saying okay serializer dot uh, the different serializer that we have uh, for this specific case uh, for creating rest endpoints, we will be talking mostly about this, like no model. This is because again, this is a simple use case. Right? Uh, you will have to jump. You will have to uh, jump in the documentation to know and know more about, like no, what is the possible of, uh, or, or what are the different possibilities that we can have with, uh, like no, with, with this uh, uh, Django uh, in general. But yeah, we will be talking about the simple use case as of now in this session, right? So what we can do is we can just, uh, like no, extend a new task as a class. And in the meta, I'm just like you no know, passing the model name, and then I'm saying the field that I want in the database. Right? Either I can pass this thing saying, okay, I can just uh, pass the utility string underscore 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 all underscore underscore, which represents we want to consider all the models that, that are there. Otherwise, the second option is what we can do is we can find a set of uh, like you know, strings. These strings are nothing but uh, like you know, the fields that are there in the model. Uh, you may wonder why ID field is not there in the model, but why ID field is there in the like you know, in the serializer, uh, and there is a specific reason for it. The reason is if I don't specify a, a primary key, Django will make it for uh, me, right? Django will make a like you know auto increment. Uh, Django will make an auto increment uh, field uh, or auto incrementing column that will be a primary key of the table, which will be an integer obviously, and uh, by default how it will do it, right? So that's why I have not defined it, but it will be there for sure, right? And yeah, that's how uh, this ID got here. Uh, the, other, the other option is I can define an ID, I can make a new ID, or like, you know, I can put my uh, like, you know, primary key generators over there, and that's, uh, that, that will also work in there. But yeah, the, the, what I'm trying to convey is uh, we have to pass the fields that we want in, this, uh, in, the, like, you know, in the result. For example, this is a model serializer. So how, what I will have to do is I will have to pass a database object, and based on the fields present over here, it will create a JSON object, right? So, for example, for this model, if I uh, if I see as a data in a JSON response, I will have a JSON. Uh, I will have a JSON object that will have three fields: right? ID, title, and completed. If I omit, if I remove completed from here, the the respond um, the responded object will have only two fields: ID and title. That's how I can you know uh, that's how I can control uh, the fields that I want in the in the slash data and the fields that I don't want in the slash data. Right. So yeah, uh, this is basically of uh, uh, defining a serializer. And our job is not done yet. Like we have to, uh, we have to do a lot of things, right? 
as you as i said this is just a serialization part we have to attach we have to create uh, routers we have to create like you know view sets and all of this so yeah we'll jump into that later right? so yeah the first part define the model the second part i uh, define the serialization uh, define the equivalent serializer for it that you would want to uh, like that you would want to implement for this right so, uh, the next part comes uh, uh, comes as like you know routing engine right so what we can do is uh, a, a Django is from basically uh, like you know, gives us those uh, like you no know, minimum of uh, those uh, different options right so the main part of using Django REST framework was uh, apart from using as, it as a serializer or, or as a router right was to use those view sets right uh, why uh, why do we want to use it uh, the reason is uh, if you remember i was talking about like you no know, several endpoints that we can uh, that we have to make when we uh, implement a rest endpoint right so uh, django ha uh, django rest framework has a class uh, that is that is known as view sets that literally has everything that we want in a typical rest endpoint right? and we can obviously customize it as per our need and that's why this session is all about but yeah, the point is, uh, we just have uh, those view sets are so extensive, extensible. We just have to pass the name of the model that we want, and like you no, know, we we have to pass a serializer that we want to use while serializing the, the data in general. Okay, so yeah. Uh, uh, since we're talking about rest endpoints, uh, again, a model view set is something that we'll be using, it, but you can also read about generic view sets. Right? Generic view sets are like you no, know, the core base of model view sets, and which it, it, it does not have any feature. We will have to implement all of those, all of the like no methods on our own. But in model view set, it is already implemented. Already implemented. We just have to use it, right? So, for example, how we can create and how we can create a REST endpoint, right? I was talking about it. Right? So, if you remember, we created a uh, we created a model. We also created we also created a serializer. If you remember, right? Now the next part comes is actually uh, is actually like no making view set for it, right? So right now, if you uh, if you see this uh, three line of code, right? One is query set, one is serializer class set. Right? In the query set, you know this is a simple query set that we use in Django to like you know list all the model set. Right? I can write anything. I can just like you know do some filtering over here. I can do order by and stuff like that. And yeah, it, it will just work. Uh, no such issues. No such no uh, such issues. Uh, no such issues uh, in, in general. Okay. So yeah, this is the query set that will be used for like you know listing. If you remember the first endpoint that we talked about, right? Listing all the tasks that we have. Or the nodes that we have, right? Uh, so yeah, we'll be uh, this and this query set will be using. Uh, will be used for the those thing, and based on this query set only, all the further like the remaining endpoints will be implemented automatically, right? I don't have to do anything at all now, right? I literally don't have to do anything now. This three line of code will uh, make the whole rest endpoint in general that we want, right? And that is what we want, right? We don't want to uh, keep writing the code that. Probably is already written uh, in a in a well uh, worse manner. We, what we care about is like you know, is making sure that the task that we have that we complete in in a deadline, and so that the business execution, the business requirements are actually meant for which we are trying to make the API call, right? So yeah, uh, we we uh, this three lines are more than enough for creating rest rest and point in general. We just define a model view set and we pass query set as M C as a class, and that's how we can like you know make it. And then yeah, uh, now the only remaining part is to actually like you no know, attach this uh, view sets to uh, the routes, right? Now we are uh, now what we have uh, we have defined a model for which we will be doing the operation. We have defined the serializer, which should be used for serializing and deserializing data. We also defined we also defined the view set, like, you know that we will that will be responding to all those different data calls in general. And now we have just had to attach it to, uh, to to the router, right? So what we do is we don't do anything, we just. Uh, yeah, we just create a default router, and then uh, you remember if you remember this is the, this is the Django code that we have on your Azure PI right in the in the project uh, in, in in the project route. And what we have to do is we have to import again. Uh, we have to import the router so that what it will do is it actually it will. If you remember, like we had several endpoints, right? We did not have a single endpoint. Yes. And when we create uh, URL patterns here, we have to uh, we have to uh, define. Every single of them uh, in, in a go right? We have to define all the endpoints that it, it, it can it can it should be able to access. Uh, like like you know this endpoint with get request should go to this uh, Discord uh, this method of this class. Post uh, method of this endpoint should go to this and this and and so on right. So yeah, uh, the what generation does it, it it even makes it, uh, it it even makes it easier for us right. We just have to define the name of the uh, we just have to write the 
plural name of the like no verb or the model that you want to for example the name of the model was task and i said we have to make it we have to keep it plural it is plural and then we just attach it in the router and that's how like no now uh, if you remember now like no if you, if you look at uh, if you look back at the history uh, we just wrote a minimum number of line of codes and now we have implemented like no very functional uh, rest and point that uh, that will be able to perform how we specific how we basic rest and point should uh, behave in general right uh, if i make if i make a get call to task it will list all the tasks if i make a post call to task and point it will create a task if i make a put put uh, put call with a specific id on the uh, on the request out it will like not update that thing if i make a pass request it will partially update it if i make a get request with the task id in the request body task slash task id it will give me that specific task and if i make a get request to it, it will also do it and that is what we do in uh, in, in a typical dash and point right and that's how we, with django rest framework like you know, it becomes very very easier uh, for us to implement uh, like you know, all those endpoints and that's how we can uh, that's how we can uh, like you know, implement rest endpoint and that, that's the uh, uh, because of using django rest now uh, this, this becomes very very easy for us to uh, like you know work with the rest endpoints in, in, in django but but is it all the question is is it all like you no know, i'll be actually done right we, we created Laser, we created view sets, we created model, and then we attach it to routes as well, right? But I was talking about we also need to um, uh, we also need to implement a lot of permissions and control, right? We want to uh, there there might be cases where uh, like you know, where we would want to have some permissions, maybe the for to access this API endpoint, user should be authenticated, right? Or it should have a uh, or probably we would want some uh, the authentication should not be the only case. rather we would want to do some custom like you know custom check of uh, implementing the authorization for example if it is a let's say if i have make a uh, if i have made an an, an lms right learning management system and if, if they are trying to if they are trying to make an api call to get the course right i have to check whether this person has actually subscribed to the specific course or not if the person has not subscribed it then i don't have to show the details of this course to the user right so this kind of permission is something that i, I would need to implement when i am like you know, when i am making a rest and point on top of it because that is a real practical case right that is a that is a scenario that we will have to deal with when we are making an application for uh, for a real life scenario in general right? and this was just a very simple example it can be anything the the, the authorization uh, like you no know, challenge can be anything uh, and yeah uh, how how do we do it in that case right because the end point that we implemented is, is completely open anyone can just make an app and they, they will just like you know they can just do it in their own way. they can just do it and we don't want that right we don't want to do it in general right so that's why we have a concept of permissions in django uh, and we have uh, inbuilt permissions that uh, no, not django uh, we're talking about django this this not right so we have some inbuilt permissions that that takes care that take care of uh, most of the use cases that we have for example if the user is not authenticated they should not be able to access those endpoints if the user is is an admin user then only they should be able to Let like, me no, access those endpoints again. So you are talking, uh, we are talking about those cases, right? Or it can be something like if the user is not authenticated, they should only be able to see it. But only if they are authenticated, they should be able to actually like you no know, update any of such things in here, right? And likewise, you can have permission, uh, custom permission as well, right? So yeah, we we have those uh, uh, those two, two options in, in Django as well. And what we had to do is we just had to attach those permissions to the view set that we just created, okay? So first of all, these are the basic four permissions that we have. Uh, that that we in any case that is the basic permission that we would want, we would need in general. Allow any basically means like you no, know, we don't have any permission uh, control here. Like we don't have put any restrictions on endpoints. Anyone can just call it and anyone can do anything. And we allow any means basically that right. It, it is uh, completely open. Anyone can like you no know, work. Is on that is authenticated uh, as the name suggests. It it will check whether the user is authenticated or not. So that means. If I put this permission on the any of the view set, that would mean that I would need to be authenticated in order to access those endpoints or those set of APIs in the view set, right? Likewise, the admin user will check for the uh, uh, it will uh, check whether uh, firstly whether that user is authenticated or not. If it is authenticated, whether the user is actually an admin user or not, right? Likewise, is it authenticated or is it not? So either it should be if the user is authenticated, the user should be able to perform every operation. If the user if the user is not 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 authenticated, the user will not be the user will only be able to will be able to perform 
read permission uh, read operations all like maybe listing and like you no know, uh, getting specific resources from the database in general. so these are the inbuilt permissions right what about the custom what about, what about the custom permissions right that that would want right so for that uh, what we do is we can uh, for yeah we will look into that firstly what do we do with those permission class that we said right what we do is if you remember this we said this is the view set that we created earlier in general right? now what we do is we just attach a, uh, a member variable permission classes and then we pass a list of permission that we want the send one to follow right so again we have to remember this is a, uh, this is a like you no know, set of uh, uh, permission that we should pass here right uh, the the uh, important thing to think, think uh, the important thing to remember is we can pass multiple permissions for this set to like to resolve and uh, only when all if we have put multiple permission it will the the way this permission class is uh, uh, this is evaluated is uh, the, the the user should pass all the permissions from in order from left to right, right? for example if i attach is on authenticated and then is admin user so it will check it will check for both of the permissions but it will firstly check for the is authenticated and then it will check for the is admin user right so in that order it is actually evaluated right uh, it is important to know because if i put uh, the other class in the front then the that front uh, the different permission will be evaluated first and then uh, the other permission will be evaluated later on in general right but yeah uh, the basic idea is we just uh, create a permission classes uh, memory available and then we attach those thing to the uh, to the model we said uh, in terms of it can be a list or it can be a set right it just had to be said uh, it just had to be an array of list it cannot be a simple thing right and yeah that's how we have the started this permission so after this change in code uh, we would need uh, like you know, what we would need is we would need those api to be authenticated first right we would need that we have some kind of cookie based authentication or maybe like token you know, based authentication in place so that they can actually call those apis and like you know, then then only it will work otherwise it will say that you know authenticated login is required and it will probably throw them an error uh, such similar error with uh, with the status with the status code of 401 saying it will not authenticated to uh, like you know, perform this action in general right what do we do in case of uh, like you know, custom permissions right so again if you want to create a custom permission like you no know, all the permissions are basically implemented from a uh, class known as base permission class uh, which we use to uh, all the permission that we are seeing right is on the, is authenticated is actually also implemented similarly in general right so when we create a when we create a custom permission we have two options right well, the first option is has permission uh, we usually define two functions in general the first function is like you no know, has a permission and the second function is has object permission right so uh, what basically it means is uh, has permission is used for checking uh, for let's say like no uh, for example if i'm trying to access a specific endpoint right so uh, I, I what i want is i want this endpoint to be accessible only for that users then then has permission will be evaluated right as in uh, when we evaluate the permission thing uh, inside this permission class the custom permission class firstly has permission is evaluated uh, only and when the has permission has actually be evaluated and it has not uh, thrown any uh, any an, an error then only it will check for the has object permission right so let's uh, let's uh, take an example of when we would uh, need such use case right where we, we would want to have two kind of permissions first would what would it would be to like you know check whether a uh, user can call this endpoint and the second will be whether this user can uh, do any operation with a specific uh, object right for example let's say you are talking about the nodes and connect right? we have the nodes and we we uh, we get the list of all the nodes in general and then what we do is uh, we we create a node we update a node we delete a node right now uh, just assume uh, just take an example of like you know what will happen for example if uh, someone can uh, like you for example if you are using linkedin and uh, like you 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 post tape uh, uh, you post some message on on linkedin wall and some other uh, and a different user can just like you know delete it on the fly and then it will be catastrophic thing right we, we don't want it to happen in general what we want is the user who has created should only be able to uh, should only be able to delete all like you know, update those posts in general no one apart from the user who initially created should be able to do it right and that's where this has object permission comes into picture has has permission will uh, will not uh, check will will check for the end point set right? uh, it will check for the specific end point for example let's say if you remember uh, on the nodes end point we had an end point where we were passing ids of the nodes right nodes slash id of the uh, id of the id of the node right 
now has object what what it what it does it also passes that specific object so for example in the ui in the url if you pass the object ready in the url in the url of the request right what it will it will do it will pass the object from the database and it will pass it here so that this function can actually evaluate whether this uh, user should be able to access that, that specific object or not right and if it evaluates it on then only that operation will be uh, like you no know, then, then only that operation will be like you no know, will be passed on from this permission otherwise it will just say okay you had the permission to access this endpoint but on a condition that you would probably be writing for example on this case what i would do is uh, what i i would want to like you no know, i would want to uh, implement for example uh, when we were talking about creating nodes right so what we'll do is uh, on the nodes table we will also add a uh, foreign key right who is the owner of this table owner equals to like you no know, maybe we want other foreign key object and then blah blah we'll refer it with a user object in general right in this uh, function he has object permission what we'll do is we'll try to check whether the request of user is actually equal to object dot user so that if they equal then only you should be able to update it or like you no know, delete it or maybe like you no know, partially update it otherwise we will just you know, whether we will just return false that would mean that uh, we don't want uh, we, we don't want you to edit or like you no know, delete any other notes of a different you know. given that's how we 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 uh, when we um, implement a custom permission that's how we implement it so the second question comes is it uh, required to implement all those all these two functions uh, when we create a custom permission no we just implement the uh, the part of the permission uh, that we would want right so it can be a combination of both or it can be any single permission in usual right? if we don't if we don't uh, uh, make uh, any if we don't implement any of the any of the underlying function be, be it has a permission or has a object permission that permission won't be validated from it will be it would basically mean that you are, we are allowing it by default uh by default we are allowing and we we'll just uh, like no it will be passing it so yeah we talked about the default permissions and now we have talked about also about the custom permission that we would we would probably need to implement like you no know, when we want to uh, implement specific uh, permission based on the data or like you no know, based on the business context that you might have that uh, that clearly is about like you no know, permissions act like is authentic authenticated or is admin user and, and, and so on right likewise uh, for example uh, we, we talked about like you know customizing the permission it can also happen that like you know often we have a, we, we we have such a requirement where like you know we uh, what we want is we want the end point to respond be differently for different set of users right for example what uh, for example let's say like you know we we have a course material right so uh, let's say if uh, in the course model we have let's say like you know, uh, we let's say we have 10 to 10 to 15 columns in that table specific table what we want is uh, uh, if an admin is making api call for the uh, to that endpoint is uh, then what we would want is we would want to return all the columns that we have in the table but if let's say if a student makes an api call we we just return a few of them right we don't return all of the columns and that that is a practical use case uh, for this use case we won't just go and like you know we create different we will we will create different endpoints right? because again for the same functionality then we would basically would be doing the same thing we will be repeating ourselves because in the and in, in the rest uh, from the rest perspective we will be implementing those rest points again and again that, that is in the, that, that 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 we don't want right rather we want to customize the behavior of how the rest one is performing if an admin is making an api call what we want is just return everything that we want the database if a normal user is making an api call just return it with a specific set of call only from out of those certain to 15 columns only like you know return with five columns in the in the response only select all of them and ignore the rest of them because it does not matter for them to know like you know what the other columns and what what does the value of it and that is a very practical use case that we have when we usually make rest and for right so what we can do is uh, uh, usually uh, like you know, there are two things that, that we can customize in any of the rest and for the first is the query set query set as in like you no know, how we are fetching the data from the database secondly how updating the serializer right so what uh, if you remember the first uh, point we talked about was serializer right like we want to serialize the data from a specific uh, uh, data model to a specific format right? and there we were talking about uh, having different fields in the serializer data right like we were talking about passing fields as in as, as a as a list or as a set right we would be passing multiple strings that would basically represent the column and what we want uh, what we want is we want to update that based on how uh, based, based on the type of user that would have right 
so how do we update the query set i, I will give you a, like a practical um, example that, that i have already handed with me right so uh, where where does this query set like you know, will actually help right for example let's say if uh, if a, if an admin is making a pay call so we what we would want is we would just want to uh, like you know uh, return everything that we have on our database but for example if a student is making a pay call what you do is like you know, we just tend to find whether uh, like you know this student is actually enrolled in course uh this the uh, like you know for this for the sake of the simplicity what i have done is uh, i have taken a very simple example right uh, so yeah database uh, uh, the database schema from the uh, from the schema perspective uh, might not be standardized right uh, because that is not the end goal here the end goal is the how we can customize it. just to show you how we can customize it in right? in, 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 in a simple way so that we understand the core concepts of how we can customize this page right? and probably what are the use cases where we would want to do this right for example uh, if we have a list of courses and uh, we have lms and in that course uh, in the in those in, in that course table we have a student as a, as a manager to manifold right where we just map students for example if a course is released we what we do is uh, when we use as we want to assign it we just append uh, uh, we just like you no know, uh, append the user on the student manager to manifold and that's how we we are trying to do it right likewise if uh, if a teacher is also there right so teacher should only be able to see his courses that teacher is created he should not be able to see others courses right but that we should be able to do and we should be able to uh, view all all of the courses right so this is what we are trying to customize here right so the uh, the view set remains same the selector part remains the same the permission classes remains the same the but the query set part changes right so for the other all behaviors it will uh, it will be the same but in this specific case what will happen is if the user is a, a super user this space it will be returned and then uh, based on the space and only all, all the remaining operation will be performed right likewise uh, for if, if the user is a student then what we are trying to do is we are just filtering out the courses where the user is subscribed like for, like for the teachers uh, uh, the courses that is owned by the teacher will only be returned uh, to the user uh, to to the to, to the teacher the teacher won't be able to show the other, other courses and all right this is handy when uh, we want to implement this authorization and like you know uh, permission control and all right and with this also i am i am stating uh, that every of uh, the this permission class will be implemented upon testing right so, so for example uh, 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 let's say like me if uh, if i had to uh, implement a get permission right so if this query does not have that specific id uh, for example you might wonder right now that what uh what, it, it, the user just use the primary key of the uh, the course right? they can just append courses slash id and then they will should they, they they might get any of the course you might be uh you, you might ask this question right you now how you we would prevent it right? the, the the thing is that it uh, by implementing something like this we are automatically preventing it so for example for super user uh this query will be evaluated and done only that dot uh, filter and then id equals to this will be used right so whatever this query set uh, get query set function it is we usually what uh, model user does it does filtering uh, uh, post uh, the query set uh, which it gets from the the get query set method in the model user if none is uh, for if you remember earlier we were implementing a query set equals to courses dot objects dot all right now we are not doing that what instead we have defined a method which is internally used by the model user right so now For example, if I if I'm a user, I have logged in as a user, and I'm trying to get specific course. Right? So, firstly, it will be this uh, uh, the 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 filtering will be performed post this uh, filter operation. Go to the user filter, then students underscore underscore in dot user dot filter id answer. So, if you 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 would understand that uh, I just cannot pass any of the id and I would get it right because if you uh, the ultimate SQL query that we will return will be something like you know the, that the user should be uh, present on in firstly what we what we are trying to do is we are trying to filter all the courses where the user is subscribed and on that course set that we have i'm trying to find if that id is present or not right so if user is subscribed to that course and only that user will get the details of the course otherwise though the id may be valid the user will be said okay that uh, like you know the course does not exist or like you know 403 or something like that because often we usually we don't want to make Them aware that like you know that this is a valid course. Uh, we say that like you know does not exist because from their context it should not exist, right? Uh, because they don't have access to it in general. Like for so the teacher as a well, uh, this uh, this will be evaluated first and then dot filter and then id equals to blah 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 whatever we have on the 
on the query set, right? So just by implementing this function, we can implement the whole query set in here, right? And that's how we can, if you remember now, our simple looking, very, very simple looking endpoint now has a lot of, uh, like, you know, uh, now it has a lot of uh, versatile performance based on a different uh, personas of the user that it would get on, on the request, right? That is, that is one part of it. The second part would be uh, like, you know, how, how, how do we change the response as well, right? So if you remember the whole point of uh, like, you know, using slices was to using it for the, the serialization, right? And we were passing uh, phase equals to different blah, 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 right? So likewise, we also have a different uh, class, uh, we have a different method in the model set that is implemented by default. We are just, we are just extending it so that uh, we customize it as per our need, right? So if you remember what I'm saying, what I have done is I had uh, I had uh, what I have done is I have implemented three different serializers for like you know, three different user personal that I have. Right? For example, if for each people user I have uh, I have implemented uh, an admin uh, co serializer which might have access to all of the fields and all of the messages that, that that it has right. But for the student role, I have a different serializer that I'm trying to pass. So whenever a student will be logged in, uh, they will, for, for any operation that would uh, uh, that is allowed from the permission. Uh, this laser will be used, and if I said, uh, let's say, if I have uh, like you know, added only two things, then yeah, uh, throughout the whole rest and point thing, the student will only be be, uh, be able to like you know, work with those two fields on. Likewise for the teacher units, right? So that's how we can probably customize it as well. Uh, this is not the like you know, uh, this is a very simple example. Again, I'm saying this is this is a very simple example of showing you how this works in general, so that you can based on your use case, you can probably use it and like you know, make sure of uh, uh, make sure of the extensibility or Django ratio or can make make use it to customize the whole less endpoint as per your case, right? This is not a very standard uh, example, but just uh, to make you explain the cool concepts, uh, I have taken this very simple example, right? So that we you are aware uh, what how this works and what is the idea behind uh, like, doing this in general, right? So yeah, uh, uh, this was the this was about the basic customization of how we we can customize the rest endpoints in general. And uh, the the last part that is sort of a bonus thing is how we do we customize the admin panel. Right? So if you if you, if you're not aware, Django by default comes with a like you no know, standard admin panel. So if you are working with Django, we don't have to create a different admin panel. Uh, we have a default admin panel that usually caters to most of the use cases that we might have in general. And yeah, it is it is usually easier to like you no know, work work with if you want to create any of the. Uh, like you've got operations if you want to create uh, uh, and the best part of it, it it is totally customizable right so yeah uh, we can uh, make use of it and uh, we can just create the client application that we would want and that's why then we called like you know the the, the framework for the artist uh, or the perfection for the deadline right we can just uh, uh, we can just use Django to like you know build a lot of good applications in a small amount of time relatively small amount of time in comparison to different uh, different uh, uh, different frameworks and uh, and and, and that is right. So how we can customize it? Like uh, we can customize the list display part. We can customize the ordering how it is being ordered. We can customize the filtering part of how the filter, filtering is performed on that panel. We can implement the searching part. So whenever you type something uh, over there, uh, all the search will be done on an AJAX manner. Like a literal AJAX call will be made to uh, to, 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 to 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 the different. Uh, rest endpoints implemented by default by the Django admin app. And likewise, you can also create custom fields, right? No, which does not probably exist, but we can just, just for the sake of uh, showing it, we can just create those fields in, in general. So yeah, I, I won't be uh, jumping mon mon much into it. How about how do how will you do it? But uh, the core idea is this is this is something that we can probably like you know, customize uh, when we talk about like you know, customizing the whole Django endpoint in general. Likewise, we, uh, we can also, uh we can also put some additions as well right uh, it is not just about the uh, uh data representation it is also about the data validation right we can put uh, like you no know, custom forms you can put custom templates uh, when i say templates you can literally make some like you no know, very nice looking forms with, with, with Django admin so that uh, if you think that like you know it, it might be a very very generic boring looking admin panel uh it is not like that like you no know, we can customize it as per our end i can just create like you no know, I can just order all the forms as I want. I can like, put additions and I can like you know nicely uh, group them as well. We call them form sets and all right. Like we, we just group a couple of bunch of fields together so that you know okay, first you have to fill this and you have to fill uh, fill that and then you have to fill all the different set of fields and all. Right? So we can all do that on the Django and that's all. 
it works in general and yeah that was about the uh, that was about the like you know, working with django in panel and, and and django in general uh, as an api the last part will be uh, we can writing tests are also a good habit of uh, like you know uh, making sure that we are writing good apis in general that's why i wanted to introduce you to two things like we have a uh, we have test options available in django by default and then we also have, uh, if you want to like you know go with say if you are working with python you might be aware about pytest right so we have a package called pytest django which uh, enables us to like you know, write pytest kind of test with, with django and that's how it, it works in the so yeah you can explore those things uh, uh, pytest django usually works on top of test it has a slightly different approach and when we combine it with django that's framework it even becomes a bit uh, more simpler for us to write test you know, right so yeah, uh, uh, this was about today's session. Uh, I hope I was able to like you know, explain you all the things uh, they had that I had in my mind. Hello again, KD. Thank you so much for the talk. <laughs> I hope I hope you had you had a blast. Um, we yeah. still have some minutes left for Q and A. So mm -hmm. also to you, maybe you wrote in your bio that you started out freelancing. Um, yeah, as your developer career, but would you mind elaborating a bit more, like how you got interested in tech? What were like the the things that gripped your attention in the beginning? Okay, yeah. So the the first thing was uh, obviously like you know the ability. Uh, so when I was in school, right? When I was in high school, uh, I so first of all uh, the thinking of like you know, the basic the core idea of like you know uh, to be able to create something of your own. Uh, it is always fascinating for me right like to create something uh, like no uh, i am all, often told like yeah, when i was a kid i used to like no tinker with uh, any of the new electronic gadgets i will just open it and i will put it back and on right so the basic idea of like no having the ability to create something with your with your with your mind is uh, something that always used to fascinate me and when I, in in the high school i was introduced to html and javascript right? and yeah i, I made in uh, i made an HTML, i made a simple html page and then it got me thinking, okay, man, uh, I can just write a couple of code and like you know, the computer can interpret it and can basically represent it in a much better way in general, right? And then I can totally control the behavior of how it works. That's how I got interested into HTML, CSS, and then later on, I took uh, computer science as a course in my uh, in, in my school days as well. I I learned about C C plus plus and I was uh, I was like, okay, now I want to do this my whole life, and that's how I got into computer science and I, I started programming and like you know, I got into web development in general. Right, so the, the the spirit of inventing something was like yeah. your your what kicked you off. Awesome, cool. yeah. very very cool mindset. And you also wrote a bit about like hackathons. I myself didn't attend one yet, so maybe mm. you want also um, telling <laughs> in the audience a bit what what is a hackathon and how yeah what's what's the process there? And you also won some of them, so maybe how do you win hackathons also? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the 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 first so the uh, coming to the first question, what 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 are hackathons? Right? So hackathons are like uh, uh, hackathons are like you no know, event where uh, you are given a specific set of time and you are given a problem statement, right? And you have to solve that specific problem in a given amount of time, right? So and that that is basically called a hackathon. Right? Usually, uh, if it is a tech hackathon, you have to create something with tech. You you create some tech solution, be it like a software, be it or be it a hardware solution, something with IoT. But yes, the core idea is we create something in a given amount of time, and we try to solve that problem. Right? The second coming to the second question: How do we uh, how do we uh, how do we win hackathons? The 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 first thing I would say is participate in a lot lot of hackathons. Often, <laughs> often you won't. Uh, there are uh, things uh, like no uh, things that are not in your control. Initially, when we first in my first hackathon, we were uh, when the hackathon started, we were like, okay, man, we are gonna kill it. We are uh, like you know, make a fabulous product, and like you know, then uh, this come these people who have been working in this industry for uh, six ten years, they will be blown away by <laughs> our product and all. But yeah, once you are awake for twenty six or thirty six hours continuously, it drains you out, and like you know, then you start uh, losing the grip of it, right? So yeah, uh, sometimes uh, uh, that grit is something that takes you uh, to the end, right? So uh, keep participating in a lot of hackathons uh, because those are the experiences that that helps you, right? So for example, the I have probably participating i have probably participated in 12 hackathons till now i think and in six of them i have got uh, some positions maybe first second or third right but in six of them we never uh, we did, did not even make to the top 10 as well right so yeah 
uh, you, you participate in a hackathon and th- then you realize okay probably i did something wrong uh, this step was something that was taking me a lot of time so then we started working on those things as well like you no know, we started making packages for ourselves so that next time when we go on an hackathon if you have to simpl- if you have to implement similar things then we don't want to do those thing those the same mistake that we did again now we have a boiler plate we just use it and then yeah we start get started with it again the boiler plate has open source as well right we are not using something uh, otherwise it will disqualify you right so yeah we are uh, making it publicly available so anyone can also use it but yeah we are the primary user of it we are making it for us as well yeah that's that's how we used to participate and it was fun back in college <laughs> but yeah thank you so much for elaborating and so maybe you encourage someone in the audience also to participate in such an event very cool there uh, we always love community driven events like this yeah so uh, Katie, thank you so much for the talk thank you so much for the q and a and wish you a nice rest of the day and see you soon yeah see you soon bye bye <laughs> all right and before we continue with the next spe- uh, talk of the day uh, just a short two minutes break Welcome back, everybody, and let's continue with Python. The next speaker of the day is developer advocate at Confluent. She believes in a human-centered developer experience, and she takes her teaching responsibilities as an advocate very serious. So one of her main goals is also to make learning a joy. Welcome, Lucia. Hi, thank you, Benedict. I'm really excited to be talking about (laughs) Kafka for Python developers today. I will, a uh, fun fact about myself is that I used to be a teacher before I transitioned into software development. Um, yeah, and I'm just super excited to give this presentation to everyone today. All right, then I would say without further ado, Lucia, stage is all yours. Yeah, let's get started with Apache Kafka. So, In 2022, there was a survey that showed that 34.16% of developers dreaded learning Apache Kafka. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I have a feeling like fear or anxiety or dread, I try to respond with an attitude of curiosity and try to understand what's, what is underlying that negative feeling. So I thought to myself, like, why might developers be having this dread of Kafka? And the first reason I could think of was that it is an entirely new thought paradigm for many people. Um, if you're not used to pub sub or publish subscribe patterns, it might be almost as if you were an API developer who now had to learn everything about databases, right? It's kind of a a shift because of the uh, unique underlying data structure. 
There's also a beautiful depth and breadth of tools in the Apache Kafka ecosystem, just like there's just a wonderful uh, spread of ocean life out there. And while that is awesome, it can also be a little intimidating at the beginning. So I wrote this talk to address those two uh, reasons people might dread learning Apache Kafka. So what is it? Uh, Apache Kafka is an open source distributed event streaming platform that aims to provide a high throughput, low latency solution for handling real time data feeds. Um, that sounds like a lot and it sounds a little bit just kind of like a blurb written <laughs> to describe Kafka, but by the end of this talk, we'll understand a little bit more about what uh, these words mean. I think it is helpful to discuss why we might want to use Kafka before we dive into the structure behind it. Kafka is very good at handling a large amount of data in real time. So it uh, is good for things like event-driven applications. So that's where um, instead of like making a request to an object or a request to an API that then is uh, activates like an object relational model, which then, you know, sends a query to the database and comes back to you. It's asynchronous and you subscribe to events. And then as soon as those events happen, all you have to do is take care of the client and logic. Um, and it's also good for things like data pipelines, mainframe conversion, and website clickstream analysis for which it was originally developed over at LinkedIn. So uh, today the uh, I've kind of adapted a template from a tutorial on Confluent developer to really think about the use case of tracking clicks on a website, putting them into Kafka and, and reading them out. So that's what we'll do today. Now, if Kafka is an event streaming platform, what is an event? Generally speaking, an event is just a thing that happens. But within the context of something like application design, it can be something like a request for a ride or a change in temperature in an IoT app, or uh, maybe in this case, it is a click, which we can represent in Kafka with a key and a value. And then uh, for ordering purposes over networks, we usually include timestamps as well. Now say you had a bunch of clicks on a web page. One was on a toggle, one was on a search bar, the other's on a start button. How are these events organized? In Kafka, we have something that's a logical grouping called a topic. And we can put all of the events um, with uh, a similar grouping like logically inside the design of our application into one topic. And the underlying data structure of a topic is called a log. So there's a couple of things to understand about logs going into it. Um, once a, an event is in a log, you cannot delete it. You can't change it. Um, it persists. And it's uh, not a queue, again, so that event persists if it's read from the log. Now, each topic is split up into a different partition, which can live on a different server in a cluster or, or a group of servers. Um, and that's what gives Kafka its qualities of being uh, low latency and high throughput. Now, how do events get into topics in the first place, right? So this is the role of the producer. Producers assign events to partitions by their key. And each producer can write to multiple topics. Now, key assignment is performed with a hash function, um, but uh, the purpose of the hash function is to make sure that each event with the same key ends up in the same partition. If a key is null, which sometimes it can be, uh, the producer will use kind of like a round robin strategy. It is, uh, we won't be using this configuration today in our sample application, but it's good to know um, that the producer is also responsible for data compression. And these two pieces of configuration, batch size and linger MS will affect your throughput, right? Um, and if you wanna increase the batch size, you also have to increase the amount of time the producer lingers before sending that batch off. Otherwise, um, you might not get the batch size that you expect. So I think that's just good to know for uh, beginners with producers. So if producers are how events get into topics, how are they read from them? 
that is the role of the consumer. So a consumer can read from many topics and it can be organized into groups in order to uh, share work. So in this case, we have consumer one and consumer two in a, in a group. And when two consumers are in one group, um, they can read from the same topic, but they cannot read from the same partition. So here, consumer one is reading from partitions one and two. Um, so that consumer two can't read from those partitions. It has to read from the third. So that makes the group ID piece of configuration for the consumer importance because every time you're creating an instance of a consumer, you want to think about which group they're belonging to and which partitions you want them to be able to read from. If you want two consumers to be able to read from the same partition, for example, to uh, scale your application, you will want to put them in different groups. Let's get into some code. So we're going to use a Python library here to create a producer instance and then produce some mock data representing uh, website clips or clicks. Uh, the library is Confluent Kafka. So um, this is parsing. I have some configuration set up and I have a topic and a cluster setup in Confluent Cloud that we're authenticating to. And so I have those details in this configuration file. Um, so we parse those and then creating the producer entrance instance here on line 23. Um, we uh, have a delivery callback so that we can uh, print an error message if it failed delivery. And then we can also present print the message or the event uh, to the console so we can see what's happening. The topic that we're using it has been predefined in the cloud and uh, the topic's name is clicks. Here are the keys and the values are these click values with timestamps. Now um, we'll take a uh, random key and a random value and put them together to mock the click event. And then um, we make sure that all of the messages are sent before we call, uh, before we exit the producer. That's what that uh, producer.flush function is doing. So let's try it out. And then we can see that those events are being produced. So let's see how we could create a consumer with the same library. Again, uh, parson configuration details at the top. We define the consumer. Um, we're setting the offset to the beginning. So something I wanted to mention real quick is that um, consumers have offsets and they're kept track of by the broker. And they're kind of like a bookmark for where the consumer is in a topic. So if the consumer goes offline uh, and, and comes back on again, the broker can start it at the spot where it left off and um, there's no events or messages missed. We're gonna consume from that same topic we just produced to. And then um, we're pulling the consumer and uh, you know printing any error message that may happen. And then uh, we're going to print a message saying which event we consumed as well. And let's see what that looks like. We can see the events that we just consumed. Now let's see what it looks like. I'm gonna see if I can get these into the same window here when I produce some. And we can see that just as soon as I produce it, we're seeing the events coming in and being consumed right over there in the left window. So it's waiting for new events. I produce some and it consumes them in real time. Just manually switch, pardon it. All right. So I do want to reiterate that all this does happen in real time with Kafka. So that leads many people to describe it as something like a central nervous system. So just like uh, the classic example of a central nervous system is that, you know, it senses the hot uh, temperature of a stove and then it coordinates the movement of your entire arm to move away from that. 
uh, just as soon as it feels that temperature. Um, Kafka disseminates information across the whole system in real time. So as soon as that event is produced, the consumer can uh, pick it up and react to it. So hopefully that neutralizes uh, the first part of the reasons to dread Apache Kafka for you. Um, so we'll proceed to the next, which is how do you navigate all of these resources? There's a lot. There's Kafka Connect, Kafka Streams, KSQLDB, at least four GUIs. There's a bunch of CLI tools, Kafka Shell Strips. I really like using KCAT. Um, like the name suggests, I don't know if you've ever like run CAT and some file from your terminal and allows you to see into the file. KCAT allows you to see into your uh, topics so that you can verify that you are producing and consuming what you think you are producing and consuming when you're setting up clients. Um, there's KC Control, there's Confluent CLI. There's something called KIPS. Now, I really enjoy reading KIPS. If you are very invested in Kafka and you want to know where it's going, these KIPS or Kafka improvement proposals uh, are the Kafka open source community's proposals for developing Kafka further for the year. Um, and I think they're usually a, a good read and uh, very interesting to see where Kafka is going, what you can do with it. And like most technological topics, there's you know a plethora of O'Reilly books on the subject that are great. So how do you navigate this big new topic? I want to take a moment to talk about the power of community. So uh, I don't think 2020 was like a great year for anyone. It certainly wasn't for me. Um, I was juggling childcare with uh, my husband and then I had uh, was recovering some from a traumatic personal loss. And then I also uh, was having some gnarly health issues. And uh, I was also doing something called a coding boot camp, uh, which was a program to teach me how to code online. And all of that stress meant that I really couldn't debug at all. I couldn't understand what was happening without a little extra help. So I turned to a community um, called Virtual Coffee. And uh, it was a bunch of online developers who really helped me. They would pair program with me online and, and teach me the key skills of coding. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful to them every day whenever I open up my code editor, you know, I think about them. But I'm also grateful for the lesson I learned, which is whenever you're learning like a big new skill, turn to your community and uh, ask the people who have used it before you, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem with this tool. Have you done that before? Uh, what were your approaches? What were the pros and cons there? Um, so I'd like to present some suggestions uh, I apologize. This is, uh, oh no, these are, these are all, uh, yeah, the correct ones. Um, there's Kafka Summit London, which is happening in person in London this, um, this May, May 16. Then uh, I can suggest checking out to see if you have a local Kafka meetup. Uh, there's current current 2023, which is happening in September here in the U S um, online. You can check out the Confluent community Slack. There's a lively red thread on Apache Kafka. There is also Virtual Coffee I.O. and CFE.dev, which are um, virtual meetups that are really great. Um, I'll be speaking at PlatformCon, so you can see me there. And then, of course, there's also this community that we are developers community, um, which is awesome. And I, I highly recommend continuing to be here and, and taking advantage of it. So hopefully that neutralizes the second reason to dread Kafka for you. Let's revisit that blurb. So Apache Kafka is an open source distributed. That means it's across many servers. Event streaming platform. And we talked about what events are, right? They're a thing that happens then within the context of applications. Um, there are things that motivate logic click requests or clicks uh, that aims to provide a high throughput, low latency solution. So thank you, partitions, for handling real-time data feeds. And we saw for ourselves how the data is produced and consumed in real time. I'd like to present myself as your first contact in the Kafka community. Happy uh, reach out using any of these communication uh, ways. <laughs> I'm on Twitter. I'm a Mastodon. Uh, you can go see my GitHub if you're interested in uh, other templates and tutorials. I like to put them up there in my pinned repos. And then uh, my personal website with my personal blogs and then my email there. Um, be happy to answer any questions you have about Kafka. And that concludes my talk.
Thank you so much. Hey, Lucia, thank you so much for the talk. So, and we still have time left for a Q&A. And I would also like to ask you, um, as I did the speakers before, how your developer journey started. You told us that you were a teacher, that you teach also like informatics, or was this an, an other process? No, that not, not at all. So I taught um, uh, for four years in elementary school, which in the U.S. is children ages two to 10. Um, and my focus there was helping them learn how to read. So um, from there, I actually started freelancing, at, set up kind of like a digital marketing agency. And one of my clients was a software as a service company. And I had a coffee chat with the CEO of that company one day. And he was telling me it was a, a, a startup and he, he was coding himself. He was telling me about how he started coding. And I thought, wow, I want to do that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and so I signed up online for um, that coding instructional uh, um, boot camp. And then from there, I uh, got my first job at a GraphQL startup. And now I, and at that uh, startup, I was engineering, but I was also doing things like live streaming and blog posting and uh, that's what led me to my current role now as a developer advocate. Talking about developer advocates, we already had one Jody today who is also a developer advocate. And we came to the conclusion that every company has a slightly different um, definition of uh, what the skill set and also the responsibilities of a developer advocate should be. Maybe you can tell us a bit about how it's at your company. Sure. Yeah. So um, it's... Definitely, um, everyone has their own like personal motivation for it, right? So mine is like, I was a teacher before I came into tech and I just love teaching people and helping them level up their uh, their tech skills. But um, the role I would say at Confluent of the Developer Advocate is to um, create information, have conversations with developers and be a uh, technical resource in the community for uh, developers who are uh, using Apache Kafka, whether they're just starting out or, you know, they have several clusters in production and, and want to know how to manage those efficiently. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that answer. Um, we got a question from the community. Where Apache Kafka is being used in real applications? Uh, do you have any right. real world examples for us? <laughs> Yes. So it was first developed at LinkedIn. So there's there's a, one um, real world use case where they used it for clickstream tracking. Uh, it's also used. I um, let me make sure uh, that I have this right. Um, it's used for things like fraud detection. So um, when it comes to things like uh, fraud, every second matters that you want to be able to detect that in real time. And Kafka represents a way that you can not just to like ensure transactions financially, but also um, like that they're not duplicated, but also you can run analyses on your events and make sure, um, hey, if, if this purchase event looks funny, then you can immediately alert your customer. The other uh, use case that I like to think about is um, is since the consumer and the producer, like they're, they're asynchronous, right? You don't have to send the requests um, to something like a database. It makes a great mechanism for decoupling microservices. I don't know if you see those like diagrams of how uh, microservices are connected and it kind of looks like a big plate of spaghetti. <laughs> and it's always uh, the, like the architectural concern is like, how do we decouple them and make it so that, um, we don't need to um, have this big plate of spaghetti and all these interconnections and, and uh, get the right information to the right developers across the organization. And an answer to that can be decoupling them using Kafka. And the, uh, with decoupling too, you always have the issue of, okay, now that we've decoupled, how does 
team A, like maybe a front end team with a microservice know that uh, team B, like how do they make sure they're sharing the same information, right? Like a, that, that, that their back end is giving the right information to the front end or, or something like that, or uh, this the right information is being shared between microservices. And Kafka has something called a schema registry, which makes sure you can define the shape of the data that's being produced and consumed. And so uh, that kind of like represents a contract between, between teams and allows them to um, communicate, but also to make sure that in decoupling, they don't lose, you know, efficient data sharing. Thanks for the answer as well. Next question. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but maybe you know the answer. Uh, why is it called Kafka? Does the name have anything to do with a certain cockroach? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, isn't that isn't that isn't that funny? Um, so it actually the people who invented it uh, really liked Franz Kafka, the writer, and producers are good at writing events. <laughs> so I think that was just the uh, just the motivation behind it, and sounded probably uh, catchy to them. So okay, thanks for that answer as well. Um, next question. Are there any job opportunity of Kafka uh, of Apache Kafka in the current job market? Do you have an overview, maybe? Um, is, uh, let me, yeah, no, uh, I can check yeah. our careers page uh, and put that in the chat. Um, but you can also head over to actually. I'll send you to Confluent Community, um, and they have, I believe, they have a Slack channel that um, it's like a job board Slack panel and you can check there, put it through so you can send it over to the chat. Yeah. Yes, we'll do. Um, we have also uh, at weirdevelopers.com listed some jobs and you can um, filter by skill set. So maybe there are also some Kafka jobs listed waiting for you. And so yeah, uh, next question. Um, since you love teaching that much, But do you know other teachers, maybe other resources, maybe YouTubers, blog writers, or anything who uh, whose main focus is Kafka and you can recommend to the audience? Yeah, I'm sorry. I lost the first part of that question over my, I think my network connection um, bleeped out or something. But uh, was it a resource for, for learning Kafka that you wanted or, or someone to follow? Both, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is... Confluent Developer, which um, is a really great resource, no matter what. And like as a teacher, I like it because it represents uh, these different ways to approach it depending on your learning style. So this is where we got um, the original code for the template that we use today in order to learn how to uh, instantiate the producer and the consumer. Um, so there's tutorials there. Uh, if you just like to like get a template and start moving, you can, uh, start there at Confluent Developer, but there's also things like, uh, YouTube courses and so, and podcasts. So no matter your learning style, you can get started, uh, at, at Confluent Developer. Um, and then let's see what other resources I recommend. There's also the official, Uh, documentation, and then I can put in the um, trying to get the correct URL. Pardon me. Great, thanks. We'll also post it in the chat. Yeah, and then I also recommend. Um, the Confluent Community Slack and uh, the Stack Overflow and Reddit resources on Apache Kafka are pretty good too, if you really want to get uh, in depth with these applications. So yes, um, you also talked a bit about the uh, Confluent Community. You got a, a Slack channel for that, I believe. Maybe you want to tell the audience a bit about what's up with that and how they can join. Yeah, so that's uh, that link that I put in there, the Confluent IO forward slash community, ask the community. And you can join there. It's a great 
a welcoming community. You can ask anything from fundamental questions about Kafka concepts to um, complex ones about configuration <laughs> there and, and, and get answers to your questions. But it's also good for connecting with the community at large. Like um, we use it as our, when we uh, accept abstracts for conferences, uh, uh, the developer advocates will uh, take a look at abstracts that are written beforehand there and help uh, give tips on how to how to write good ones. And we have a Slack channel for that. Um, but yeah, it's just a it's a good resource for getting started with with Kafka and um, for continuing to use it. Right. Thanks for that. We got another community question. Are there any alternatives uh, of Apache Kafka and how do you see Kafka in the future? So two questions packed in one. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I, so for Kafka alternatives, what I would say is like, take a look at, I don't know if there's necessarily like, um, it's something that I could ask the open source community, but the, I, I think it like when you're thinking through your problems with organizing data, what you'd want to do is think through like, what exactly do I want to do with it? Um, is do I need it to be in real time? Do I have a ton of data that I want to scale? Is it going to be needed to be scalable? Um, and then consider your other options there, uh, your other open source options, I guess, if you're if you're looking with an open source. Yeah, uh, talking second about open source, sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, Kafka, Kafka in the future. Um, yeah. yeah, for that, <laughs> I would go definitely go look at the KIPS, the Kafka improvement proposals, and you can see. Uh, exactly what's happening with Kafka in the future there. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you talked about a bit about uh, open source also. Are you contributing to any open source software yourself? Or do you know any cool projects for the audience maybe to contribute to? Yeah. So I am beginning to contribute to uh, Kafka Streams. And Kafka Streams is part of the Kafka open source, like, umbrella. Um, and what Kafka Streams enables you to do is it enables you to um, it enables you to uh, aggregate, filter, and like analyze different topics and streams of data. Um, there's also, I believe, but that's in Java. So let's, uh, let's find, I'm going to find a uh, open source Python Kafka library and put it in the chat so that I'm just trying to find the docs and make sure that this one is open source for me. <laughs> We can also send it afterwards if you're in a yeah, hurry right, right now. So, so we, we don't need to rush it, I think. And you can afterwards yeah. look it up and we will we will share it. But yeah, it yeah and you can definitely also, if you like Java too, yeah, you can get started with contributing to Kafka yeah. itself or, or the client libraries. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, next question. I am new to Kafka. Is there a difference bet between Confluent Kafka and Apache Kafka? Okay, yeah. Um, so Apache Kafka is the open source, um, the open source offering, right? So, um, and Confluent is not uh, open source. And what we, what, so the, a couple of the original co creators of Kafka created Confluent, and Confluent, um, the role of the company is to make it easy to connect your apps data systems and your entire organization with real-time data flows and processing using the open source tool Apache Kafka. Um, 
so there is a difference between those two uh, those two organizations. Uh, that's good to know. Obviously. <laughs> All right. Thanks also for this. Um, got another question. Um, because, yeah, it's, uh, I'm also curious. You started coding in 2020 and now you are a speaker, which is quite fast. <laughs> uh, what were the main milestones in your coding history? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It makes me think one, one thing that, uh, it, I think made that fast is that because I was teaching before I was coding, I'm, uh, fairly familiar with public speaking already. Um, so it wasn't something that I needed to add it on to the skill of coding. Like, and it's something that I started doing almost right away. As soon as I was just learning how to code, I, um, would turn around and try to share that with others through things like blog posts. I think the first talk I did though was in the virtual community, virtual coffee, and they um, really helped me boost my skills because they have things like um, community hosted lightning talks and you can submit a lightning talk and kind of get used to talking about technical things, but in, with public speaking that way. Um, so that's, I think I uh, really, that's one of the reasons that um, I'm giving talks like I just a couple of years after starting coding today is I really like sharing what I learn with uh, beginner audiences and that I've had the support of community. Yeah, good mindset right there. <laughs> awesome. Happy, happy that you enjoy sharing. We all, always love uh, speakers who like to share. <laughs> so uh, next question. What are the pitfalls, pitfalls of using Kafka? What to avoid? Ooh, yeah, I have uh, a great blog post series. So um, it's, it's basically called Debugging Kafka. It's written um, here's Danica Fine and Nicoletta Verbeck and it can help you when you run into those pitfalls, like the particular ones with configuration. Um, it can help you understand, and it's a series, I think there's three parts. It can help you understand what kind of metrics to look at in order to see what, what's going on with your application. Um, at the beginning, I would say like, just looking back on my experience learning Kafka, it's really important to understand how uh, consumers and producers uh, are configured and organized. Like for example, I was trying, I was developing one of my first applications was just like an example of how you can decouple microservices. And I had them all um, in the same group at first and within the microservice like um, example, you're going to need them to read from the same partition. And so I wasn't able to have them uh, have those uh, consumers read from the same partition and all of a sudden the messages weren't going through and it can get a little like confusing, like the first, um, the, the first few times you do it. But I, I always recommend doing something like three times <laughs> in, in different, either in different clients. Like, um, I gave it a shot with the Python tutorial and then also in node. Um, and then I have like an article about getting started with stuff here. Um, Cause it's hard, like with the, with Kafka, there's so much to know. It's like, what, what do I not know? Um, so I think trying it out, like with a few different solving it, uh, solving problems with Kafka in a few different ways can help you see what's common to Kafka solutions. And then what's com like, what's part of like a client library or, um, part of a particular like offering from a company. Um, yeah. But yeah, makes sense. Um, next question. If you would have to start all over again with coding, what would you change? Uh, new languages or tech stacks or maybe taking other courses? Mm, thinking about that one. Um, I was lucky that the uh, curriculum at the coding online course that I did was pretty thorough. So it was two full stack applications that I had completed by the end of it in JavaScript and Python. Um, I think those are both great beginner languages. Maybe I would have started with Python. I think it's a little more human readable. <laughs> um, but uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know if there's anything I necessarily would have changed. Um, because even if something was a little bit more difficult at first, maybe just pairing sooner, you know, um, I think, I think it's great to, to pair with somebody who understands how to help a beginner and not like kind of bring them down. Cause you definitely need, need that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all, all I have to say is like uh, live help is great. Um, and don't be afraid to, to ask questions. Everybody has them at first. Um, and the other thing right now that I think a lot of beginners, this is not directly related to the question, but a lot of be let's see, uh, because they will know how to use it in a way that will help you learn instead of like hindering your learning, your learning and your, your progress there. So, all right. Yeah. Thanks for that. And um, we got another very curious question. Um, when is the perfect moment to learn, learn working with Kafka, like uh, from a seniority level wise? Oh, that's great. You can, uh, you can enter uh, the Kafka world at, at any time. It just depends, like seniority level wise. Um, it is something that is often used like across large organizations. So some people think of it as as a, something that's like, oh, that's for architects, right? But it's it's really not. Like you can get started learning the basics and the fundamentals um, right away. It's just a, it's just another back end technology. Like um, think of it just like as it's well, whether or not it's a database is for debate. Um, did, I think uh, we got I, some there. connectivity issues right there. Maybe you can. Uh, um, yeah, what I was going to say is uh, don't necessarily think of it answer, as something, <laughs> something that's only for software architects. Uh, developers can learn it at any level and just think of it as a way to manage data, a new way to manage data. All right. All right. Thanks. Uh, Lucia, thank you so much for the talk and for the Q&A. It was a blast having you. I hope you had fun too. Um, yeah, and as, I think a lot of a lot of us learned a lot from you today. So goal achieved, <laughs> and it was quite a joy. So second goal also achieved. <laughs> then I wish you a nice rest of the day, and hopefully see you soon at another live day. Yes, yes. Thank you, Benedict. I've I've really enjoyed being here, and the questions were awesome. Thank you, everybody, for <laughs> putting them in. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> All right, and to the audience, don't forget to check out our partner event uh, with the, the InfoBit Co Connect. The link is in the chat. And now we are going into a 20-minute lunch break. So uh, grab a bite to eat or maybe a coffee or go for a quick walk. And we will see each other again in 20 minutes, which is uh, 2, 2 p.m. Uh, Central European summertime. Stay tuned.
Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now. Welcome back and right back to Python and the final speaker of the day. He is technical writer at Hack Mamba. He helps others learn web technology through teaching and writing. So as many people as possible can benefit from his experience in several programming languages, documentation, and also open source. Welcome, Terry. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, Terry. Yes, we can hear you. We can see you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome that you could made it, make it. Um, would you mind telling the audience and me a bit more about what we are going to learn from you today? Um, so today uh, we'll be discussing about building APIs with Flags and testing it with Postman. As you already know that most other developers use majorly Node.js to write or to build APIs, but today we would be using an alternative called Flags and hope you enjoy the talk. We will. And then I would say without further ado, the stage is all yours, Terry. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my talk. So today I'll be talking more about no more node, but building apps, building APIs with Flaps and testing it with Postman. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm a technical writer at Mamba, also a software engineer. And one, one fun fact about me, I love to travel, I love to do a lot of adventure when I have time. Um, so what the agenda for today would, all, would be about probably what is API, why use Python over the JavaScript runtime, which is Node.js, why Flux, a little bit. I'll, I'll do a, a bit of demo for, for everyone to see, and also question and answer at the end of the talk. Now, on a lighter note, um, let's let's talk about um, about there are rooms for improvement whenever you stumble on a new programming language or a new um, framework that you're about to use. So don't give up, but always like give it a chance and always like you have to improve on every time you 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 work on a new programming language. So for this particular Zen of Python, it's just like a poem that encourages all developers to to always think about the simple aspect of programming instead of the complex part. So if you want to activate this on your system, you just go to your terminal and type in the Python and rep, rep command. And after doing that, so just a demo, I'll just like go on this and type this and just like import the, the module, import this. And when you do this, you can read about the design of Python that does give you a booster to make sure that you keep on going no matter when you want to give up. Um, so to the next slide, so what's, what are APIs? APIs are just um, code that interact with one another. So um, let's talk about maybe on the client side, which is the browser, and go to the backend, the server. So it's 
the browser sends a request down to the server and the server returns a response back to the back to the client, which is the browser. So a typical example is just going to google.com. And when you type in google.com, that search query takes you down to where the information has been stored on the server and returns back your data. So just a simple analogy of what APIs are. Um, so if you, if you enter this particular like endpoint or this particular URL on your browser and replace this name with your own um, particular profile name, it's going to give you this um, JSON format of your information of what your profile is all about. So it's going to tell you your, like this is the avatar URL, the, your image for, on your GitHub profile and several other information that you need to know about yourself having a profile on GitHub. And why Python? As you all know, Python as Python as a programming language has existed for over three decades, and it is it is its use case is cut across so many different fields. So from data scientists to machine learning experts and data analysts and all whatnot. So it's it's not so, it's not a new programming language that it has it, it has stand the test of time and it will always continue be, to become relevant. And you know that from a survey from way back in, in 2022, it shows that Python ranks number four as the most popular programming language in the world. So it's not something that you need to run away from, but it's something you need to embrace. And as you, as people always say, Python reads like, read like English. So you can always like learn it and it's quick to always like jump on it and learn easily. So you will not have any struggle picking up Python as a first, first programming language. Um, so a simple example of what we'll be talking about when we start coding is just this, just a simple demo of what the minimal application of Flux is going to look like when we start writing the code. And over to Node.js, if you want to create a server, if you want to create your first endpoint on, on Node.js, do I'm using the Express framework for Node.js. So these are the code that you have to write maybe on your app.js file. And when you do that, it listens, it listens on a particular port, which is port 3000, which I specified on the screen here. And when you eat this particular endpoint, which is the home route, it's going to tell you, it's going to give, it's going to bring out the JSON um, data for you, which just shows you this information called um, message, we are all developers. So it's just a simple way for you to just test if you are a Node.js developer. And for, for body, like this, this is just the result from what I just shared earlier from the, for both Flux and Node.js. So on the left-hand side of my screen, it shows the result of what, when I entered the information for the data I presented on my file on, on Python, on my Flux Python file, and it gave me this result in JSON format. And on the right is also the Node version. And Another way for you to understand Flux is that you can always use it to build a web application, like a website. So some years ago, I stumbled upon Flux and I learned about building a website using just Flux and using the template engine called Jinja. So with this on, on, the, on a, with a screenshot here, it shows me the demo of the project I built with Flux. And if you click on this URL, it takes you to the URL for this particular website. So it's not only for building APIs, but you can also always adapt it to building web application if you so desire. And now Postman, as you can see rightly on the screen, Postman is a collab collab collaborative API platform used to test, monitor, design, and build your APIs with a user interface. So it gives you this appealing visual representation of what your response is going to look like at the end of the day. And for this particular section, when we start using it, um, when we start using Postman, we're going to write, we're going to write some test in Postman. We're going to also generate code, which can always, you can always like generate code for other programming language for your, for your response and always also document your API request. So just something like a readme file, like you use in your other projects. So you just like document, like show, like a description of what your API is doing in Postman. So when you share your project with maybe your team or any other person, they can easily have a feel of understanding of what you've done for that particular endpoint. And now to the demo. 
I would, for this particular screen, um, for this particular first one, for the first uh, file I'll be working on, I would want you maybe to start, if you can, to start your, um, like open your, your, your file in, in VS Code because I'm using VS Code as my IDE. So for, for instance, if you are a first time Flux developer or maybe you're just like coming across Python, the first thing you're meant to do is that, as you all know, for, for Node.js, there's a package manager that helps you install libraries and uh, which is npm but for python it's called pip so you the first thing you need to do is that you need to install the package which is flux so you need to install this before you can use it so after you've installed this using the command npm install flux i think it's flux if i'm not mistaken okay sorry Yeah, so npm install flux. If you install, if you install this package, it's going to give you all the commands or all the functions within this particular package. So the first thing you're meant to do is, is um, import the flux module and the request module from this particular package, which is flux. After that, you have to initialize your instance of the class, which is this Donda method called name, which you have to declare to the variable and for, for line five is just an empty empty list, which we're going to like fill. We're going to populate, append the um, other responses, which is the data into the model list. And once you are here, you have to now use your decorator. It's in this particular endpoint, called, which is called um, forward slash friend. And the dot get is just the um, get method, which is the first method for, um, creating your, your endpoint, which is you want to send, you want to retrieve that endpoint and get the information at the end of the day. Um, so once you do this, and if you start this particular, so if you want to run this particular app on your terminal and see the response in Flux, on Py, Postman, sorry. So you have to type Flux um, double, with a double dash app and the file name, which is, APIs and and run. So once you do this now, it's going to tell you it's starting on a particular port, which is 127-m.0.0.1 and colon 5000. So let's go to Postman and test this particular endpoint and um, forward slash route. So in Postman, there's um, we we create a collection which is like a we group all our requests into a collection folder. So for this particular demo, I created a folder called We Are Devs and included all these all these requests in this particular folder. So in case I want to revisit this in the future, I can always like have a reference for me to come back to, so that I I, I will not I will not lose the file at the end of when I close this uh, particular um, application. So for the first one, I did get friend. So I'm looking for the past, um, yeah, get off friend. So if I eat this endpoint, if I click on send now, it's going to show me an empty list because when I declare this uh, model for this list, it was empty. So the next one is to send, is to send uh, like your, is to send a, a, is to send some lists of information like posting, um, your information back to the server, which is using the um, get and post method. So you define the get and um, function, which is function, you can use any name. So using a name is not particular, you, it's not like, it's not, it's not defined. So you can use any name and it will still work. So after you've done this, you, you use this particular um, function, which retrieves the um, JSON of um, content from your defined um, um, dictionary. And once you do this, and you now append this new um, list that you've created into the model, um, you, you create a new dictionary, sorry, and append this dictionary that you've created into the list model. And after you've done that, you return this new friend 
which is going to give you the list of your new creation that you just created using the post method. And if we do that now, we'll just change this particular um, method to the post. Um, we have changed this particular get method to the post, which would create a new body and send that body using a JSON type and send that information to the server. So if I click on post method, I can just like type my name, which is Terry. And once I send, once I click on send here, it's going to show me the response at the bottom of your of the application postman here. And if we add more information, the ID is always going to increase by one because when, when I did this, I made sure that I used the length model and the length function to increase the model instead of me manually typing the ID. So it increases it automatically by one. So if I do another name now, I just type Nicholas. I say, click on send, it's going to increase by one. So to confirm that this stuff actually like saved in the model list, I go back to my get all friends endpoints and click on this send. Now it's going to show me all the list I just created, all the dictionary I just created into the model, into the list now, into the model list. Um, the next one would be to get a particular friend. So we'd use this endpoint and use the ID so the ID would be replaced by the ID we created from this post method. So once you want to declare, just like um, Node.js, you call in the ID after the um, friend um, endpoint. And once you do that, you pass in the parameter ID here and just return the particular model with the index of any particular, with the index that you want to find the list of that particular person or that particular friend. And once you do that, you can pass in the, so, um, the status code, which is depending on whether you want, if you want to pass it, because automatically this default as um, status code of 200, or if you want to always pass in your status code, you can just like put the comma beside the model um, bracket ID and just like write your 200 status code. And if you now run this particular get a friend endpoint, you're just going to get that um, created um, name, which is Terry initially, remember? So if I click on this, it's going to bring out my name, Terry, with, with the ID of zero. And the last one for this particular section is just to delete a friend from the, end, from the, from the list, from the model list. So the same way I did it, I did for get a friend, I pass in the, the friend endpoint and just the ID. And after that, I pass in the, the parameter ID and just use the delete att attributes with the model, with the index model, or maybe zero, one, any one I want to create. And I return this um, JSON success message, which is going to tell me data successfully deleted from the server. So once I do this now, I go back to the to Postman and I look for delete a friend, which if you want to create a new request, so you click on this three, on this three ellipses um, icon. And once you do that, you can always add a new request to your collection. So that is how I created all this collection prior before this presentation. So once you do this and want to delete a particular um list and dictionary from the, from the model list, you just maybe state your ID in front of the friend um, endpoint. And once you click on, on send, it tells you it has successfully deleted from the server. So to confirm that this was successfully deleted, so I go back to the get all friends endpoint and I check it again and to confirm, I click on it and it only returns me Nicholas as the write um, dictionary that is returned now. Um, let's go to the second example right now. I would stop this server, the development server, so that I would, once I run, run the server again with this particular um, file name, it returns me the particular um, information for this file. So I will just close this, save this file, and close so that my window will not be cluttered with a lot of information. So for this particular, this is the same method again. Import your your flan, your model, 
which is Flags from the package name Flags. And the request is just, we now want to work with a real um, API that is stored on the web. So this particular API, which is just the information of, of um, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, I immediately like initialize the app again and passing the the URL for the the URL for the crypto cryptocurrency if um, data which will give me the information of Bitcoin in the market. After that, I pass I pass in the the endpoint which is crypto. Pass the information again, and once I do this, it's going to return a successfully like it's going to return a status code of 201 which is created so there are different status code in when you're creating api so from 100 to 500 so it, it has different different meaning um so for now once i i i call this endpoint using the request function and passing this variable here is going to give me the JSON format of the information of this endpoint. Um, and now I use a conditional, which is just response status code to just check if this status code is not 200, give me this information, give me the error information. But if it was correct, then return the data for this um, particular URL. So I would first test this application to give me this response, which is an error, because right now, as you can see from this URL, I, I typed at the end of the, um, in front of the asset um, parts, I typed in Bitcoins instead of Bitcoin. So if I test this app and let me run the development server again, and the file name is called app and just type run. Once I click on that, it starts this development server. So I go back to Postman and test this particular endpoint or this URL. Um, so I look for the particular, yeah, yeah, cryptocurrency request. Once I click on this, it's going to sell me, it's going to give me an error message. So let's try it. So can you see? Because it was a wrong, we typed in a wrong um, path name, which is Bitcoin instead of Bitcoin. So to just test that this thing is actually like working, I'll delete this and save it again but right now because i'm i have to always restart my server so i have to stop it and run the server again once i go back to postman and i click on this send it's going to give me the information of bitcoin currently in the market so this is just a simple way for you to test the live url in postman using this particular method um yeah so for the next one, let's go over to the next file, which is code and, okay, no, before then, let's go to the, to the, um, I think I, there's nothing here. I think I deleted something. Okay, so for now, since we are done with, with just the creation of using the, the various um, method, which is get, um, delete, um, post, but I had difficulty in using the put method because it was giving me some, I got it, but I didn't, I was not able to like override the particular name for the, for the first um, file like created when I showed you the get friends um, request. So what we want to do next is we want to use postman to generate code for one of these particular requests that we created. So in Postman, you can always generate code and use that code in different programming languages. So before I do that, let me just start my development server for any particular file. And I just maybe, let me use the API, API's file again, and click on start the development server. And once I start the development server, maybe I want to create like, a, like I want to generate code for this particular endpoint, which is, let me first um, post it. Let me first send the send data to the server so that it has information. So for this particular get all friends, and if I click on it, it returns me. So if once I want to generate any code, I click on this icon at the far right, 
at the far right of your screen of the postman window. And once I click on this icon, it can generate me any code in any different programming language you want to try out. So for instance, I want to try out the post, the Python code generated, the code um, generated code with Python. So I click on this, it gives me the result. And if I post, if I copy this file and I send it to my, to my, um, what do you call it? My VS code and maybe create a new file. And I, I, I paste the information I got from Postman into this. And I want to just check whether this information is actually like correct. Let me um, open a new terminal and just like run this code so that you confirm that it actually like works. So I just use the Python command with the file name, which is code.py. And if I click on send, can you see it returns me the same information that I created earlier using the post method. And finally, I want to talk about how you can document your APIs. How you can document your APIs because as you rightly know, as developers, when you create a new a new project on and you post you you send your 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 code to GitHub, the right thing to do is always to have like a um, like a readme file. And with Postman, you can always do that with your various endpoints. So if you want to maybe create a a documentation for if you want to document your APIs. You go to the same far right of your screen and click on this icon, which is called documentation. And with this, you can always like ed click on this pencil icon and it accepts Markdown. So you can always like give it any name you like. Um, so maybe for this particular file, I want to just write get all friends. And I want to explain what the endpoint is. So it gives me it's it returns all the data when I when I eat a popular. so I'm just giving an instance so you can always like elaborate and make it more um beautiful or more concrete for people to understand what you're talking about. So so once you do this and you don't need to save because they automatically like save for you. So if, if you share this um, your your collection with any any developer, you will always have access or the developer will always have access to this to this documented um, API. Um, so the last thing I want to actually like do is to run some tests to make sure that what we wrote actually like works. So if you want to write tests, just like when you're writing tests for your code, maybe React or any programming language, maybe using JS, Cypress, or any, any tool out there, in Postman, you can always run your test when you click on this, on this, um, what do you call it, test tab. And once you click on this, you would, you can, so let's, let's just delete this. So this was something I wrote earlier. So if you want to check whether this actually like return the status code of 200, Postman has already given you some um, some template for you to like to use. So if you want to check whether this status code return the 200, this um, endpoint return the status code of 200, you can just click on this and it populates the information on this on this um, window and it tells you PM test status code is 200 and PM dot response to have status. So it correlates with this particular response at the bottom end of your screen or in, in Postman, window in Postman. So this 200 is actually like this test is checking whether this status code is the same on this particular endpoint. So if I click on this, it's going to tell me the test result, click on this tab on your response um, window and once you click on this, it tells you status code is 200, which checks this particular endpoint to tell you that you actually like got the, you actually like wrote the correct code, something like that. Um, so you can always like try different um, tests for your endpoint and just like 
make sure that it passes. If it if this particular endpoint fails, Postman is going to give you some suge suggestion on how to correct it and what to change in your test request window. So um, yeah, this is it. Um, so for other resources, apart from apart from using the Flax package, you can always use the Flax RESTful package to do the same thing like what you just demonstrated earlier. So this particular one uses a class to present, to create endpoints. And what are the, this is a screenshot of what this particular uh, package can do because I tested it and it gave me the same results with what we just did um, some minutes ago. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, this is it for now. And if you want to like check the resources, you can always like scan this QR code and it takes you to the to the um, GitHub repo and you can see what we just did in this presentation. Thank you. Hello again, Terry. Thank you so much for the awesome presentation. Also, love your QR code. That's some um, good usability right there. <laughs> yeah. Always make that much easier for the audience. All right. Um, let's jump into a quick Q&A. And also to you, the question. I'm curious, how did your development journey start? How did you become interested in tech? What were your first uh, key points? And how did you get there where you are now? Um, so my development journey started some years ago. So I always like struggled on in understanding some concepts uh, before. So what accelerated my learning was I when I adopted start, when I start, started writing as a technical writer. So this gave me some leverage to get better in my in my craft, which is software engineering, like coding, and it has really like helped me to write for different pub publication and just made, made me a better programmer because without it, I think I could, I could have still been a very like maybe poor developer or very, maybe not so good developer because I struggled a lot in learning because I wanted to like just learn a lot of programming languages without any proper roadmap. But when I found out that I need to just concentrate and learn the fundamentals, and if you learn the fundamentals, maybe for one programming language, it's always easy to switch to any other programming language because you already know the syntax for each for that particular program and can take it to the next programming language and just use it for yourself and you have a better understanding just learning the fundamentals. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, always start with the basics, of course. Don't, don't shoot for the moon too soon. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Terry, you're a technical writer. Um, maybe you want to elaborate a bit about what the position of a technical writer involves, what are your responsibilities and maybe also your day-to-day -day work? Um, so a technical writer is just um, someone that writes how to guys tutorials and just make sure yeah, you break down complex um, subjects, so it may not just be a software engineer, just break down so complex subjects to very simple terms. And so it's just like a link between a piece of software and those who use it. So for instance, I just demonstrated Python. At the end of this presentation, I can just like turn this presentation into like a technical, like a writing, which is technical, technical, and just make sure that I break down what I've just discussed now to people that want to try it out and just like doing the same process again. So you're just making sure that you give the your audience, your target audience, if they are if they are beginners, advanced learners, or anybody. So they can always like read your article and get a better understanding because they're in their particular field and you've simplified those terms into their own understanding. So it's just a way to just write and make sure that people understand a piece of software or a technology, depending so for any particular field. OK, thanks. When it comes to these uh, technical articles, do you have any uh, go-to points, how you start, or what are may maybe the, the key points that a good teaching article should include from your perspective? So a good teaching, what a good 
article um, should include. Okay, yeah. go on, please. Uh, th there was a question, sorry. <laughs> okay, so what, what a good article should contain should be, um, so there are, there are guidelines or there are style guides for, for each company. So for the companies I've worked with, so there are style guides on how you can create technical content. So your technical content should not just start with coding immediately. So you need to first research on the topic, know your target audience, maybe do some SEO so that you can understand the keywords that you're going to use in your article so that it can rank at the end of the day because you don't want to just write and it's not just rank on maybe Google or any other search engine. And you need to have, like, you need to learn the, you need to learn how to write, maybe take a course, which is important. There's a free course on Google called Technical Writing um, yeah, technical writing. So with that, you have to, when you want to start your article, basics. So you have to have a good introduction to, just like when we started the, this talk today, you told me what people wanted to learn. So you need to give an idea of what people will learn at the end of the day when they read your article. And from there, you have to the, maybe the body and just con continue down to the conclusion. So it just takes it from the beginning, which is just the introduction of what at the end of the day, what someone is going to learn. And once you're done, you recap what you've written so far from the introduction to the body, the conclusion now recaps everything that you've built or you've written. Thanks for elaborating, Terry. Uh, we got some more questions from the community. What are the pitfalls of using Flask in comparison to Node? Hmm. That is a tough question. What are the pitfalls? <laughs> I will, I will, Take your time. I, will, hmm. I, know, I don't know the answer, to be very honest, because I've never like never thought of that particular question on what the pitfalls would be. Um, so just just for just for an example, so I before this demo or before this talk, I was trying like um, integrating MongoDB with this particular code, and it gave me so much difficult. I don't know if it's the package or anything that that did not work, and which I found so annoying. But when I tried it with Node and MongoDB, it works. So I don't know if there is some maybe the um, the particular package is not being updated, but I think. Flag just gave me a lot of difficult time trying to make sure, like the put a method, I found, I we did and we did that particular section of code, but I didn't get it. I didn't get it. So maybe I need to go back to the drawing board and just like rethink this question. And maybe I have to like give an answer in another, another maybe talk or any other. Uh, maybe there can be like a another like presentation on its own. Yeah, we'll come back at it. When, when you're speaking next time at the live day, I would say, let's let's keep it yeah. in the backlog for now. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, but we got some more questions from the community. For example, are there alternatives for Postman for testing? Do you yes, know there are. Um, so for this one, so I just like, there's what what is called insomnia. Yeah, just like insomnia, like when you're not sleeping well, <laughs> but is... Um, then so then can you still see my screen? Yes, yes. Hello. Oh, so yeah, so this is an alternative for Postman. So you can always use Insomnia to 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 test your APIs. And there's another like extension on VS Code. I don't know if it's called Postwoman. I need to check, but there are there are alternatives for it. And I think Rapid API also gives you that. Um, that opportunity for you to test your API in VS Code. So you need to like check those extensions on VS Code, but an alternative for Postman is Insomnia. So Insomnia is an alternative for Postman. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks for giving us um, options. <laughs> um, next question. What concepts did you struggle the most and how did you overcome it? 
Um, what concept did I struggle the most? So I, yeah, so the perfect example is using this um, delete method, which like deleting a particular, like a particular dictionary from the list. So I, what I did, how I overcame that struggle was I had to Google and just like find different stuff, like using different, the attribute that is, that is containing Python. And I, that is how I was able to solve it. So when you um, encounter any challenge, which is trying this thing on your own, you have to like do a lot of Googling, maybe it will bring out some articles, maybe some YouTube videos or whatever. It's just for you to test it from that resource or maybe a stack overflow question um, answer. So that is just how I overcame that particular section of code when I encountered it. All right, thanks. Um, when talking about uh, YouTube videos, blogs, you already gave some resources at the end of your talk, but maybe do you have some other go-to maybe YouTubers, for example, when it comes to Flask or Postman? The other resources you can re recommend to the audience? Yeah, so, so for, for Flask, I don't have any particular, um, like a, an authority YouTuber, but for Postman, so for Flask, I think you can just use any i think the videos are somehow like some years ago so you need to like check it and make sure that it's up to date and if you are you are doing it then you have to like if you encounter error like i said you have to do your own little you know research and um, use google and try to solve it so for postman postman has like a like they have their resources so if you go to their website, there are there are resources on how you there are, there's what it's called thirty days of postman where you have this you can learn postman in thirty days and just like try different um different um lessons that they actually like um combine together for you to learn. So there are various resources on postman and there's they all they they do, do regular webinars on various, maybe the new releases they have. And so you can always like register for that and get an update on when to use Postman and when to get information on the new webinars. But the um, website gives you an accurate um, learning platform or learning resources for you to use at any time. Hey, thanks for that useful information, Terry. Um, you wrote in your bio that you have experience with open source, are you currently working on any open source projects or do you have some to recommend to the community which they can participate in? Um, hmm. I, yes, I work with open source. Um, so for recommendation, so there's, if you want to get, if you want to start open source and if you want to find some, some good first issues to work on, so, for instance, I don't know if my, yeah, it's working. So I will show you so a very simple trick or now you can discover, let me just, let me check. Let me click on explore and just show you how you can discover some very, let's say, I'm just using an example. So if you want to check some good first issues on GitHub and contribute. So you can just like in front of this URL, for maybe I don't know, lab chain. So when you do this and type in contribute and click on the enter button, it's going to give you like some resources on the good first issues. So for any company, so look for any company that you're interested in and just put the contribute slash contribute in front of the URL it's going to show you some good first issues that you can just like click on it and just like look read through their contributing guidelines or anything and just work on it if this interests you. And for, for I'm not currently working on any particular, but I did one last year, which is a combination of is a resources for technical right, writers. So I did that last year and I was, I contributed to that particular repo. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks also for these insights. We got another question from the community. Um, he wants to know if you if you have to start all over again, what would you change in becoming a developer? Hmm, what would I change? So, like I said earlier, 
I, I was this kind of naive person initially when I started. So I wanted to learn everything. I didn't focus on one. So that's made, made me to lose a lot of like speed. And I didn't find a lot of opportunities doing that. So learning PHP, learning JavaScript, not focusing on, focusing on any particular language. And if I'm to start all over again, I would tell myself to to start writing as early as possible, document my learning. Learning in public is called is called learning in public. So I'll document all those things and make sure I write on any new concept I learn and just like put, publish the article or anything, maybe on Stack Overflow or on dev.to or Ashno. Just make sure that I have this body of work that if I want to switch later in, in my line, I can always like go and do technical writing, I apply for technical writing roles, and that would be like a very good opportunity for me to 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 boost my my career faster. So I would let me reiterate again. So I would ensure I focus on one programming language and learn the fundamentals. And if I'm good enough with that programming language, I would if I want to learn on that one, I can switch. But I want to get a job and focus on using that programming language I learned. And for the for the in, like after doing that, I will start documenting my learning as early as possible as I'm learning any programming language. So it's just for you to focus on one and always document, posting on Twitter, posting on LinkedIn, so that you can always have a reference at the end of the day, going back to what you've done. Because your articles or anything that you've published out there would always like help you when you maybe you are forgotten a particular maybe syntax or anything problem and how to solve a particular problem. So if you have this stuff on online and you search and your, your the result comes out and it brings out your name, which is a good, which is a bonus for you, a plus for you. So it gives you that, it gives you a name, it gives you a brand for yourself. So I, yeah, that would just be my answer for that question. Okay, yeah, that's some pretty good advice right, right there. People listen to Terry. <laughs> and uh, Terry, you also write in your bio that you like to teach. Uh, do you do this only through the technical writing or do you give courses or are you a regular speaker at conferences? Um, or are there any other ways in which you contribute yeah, so to the community? Now, I, I, I mentor, I mentor, like I do, a, I do mentorship. I've also like, taught some students on HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and Python, in, like I think two years ago. And yeah, I do, I do, I do anything. If I'm called upon, I, I have this chance. I'm always like putting myself available out there to, to, to give my time and anything. So for speaking, I've done a bit of speaking in the past, but for international speaking, this will be my first big international speaking engagement. And I really appreciate we are devs, developers. So yeah, I really appreciate it. But for speaking, I want to do do more of this and and let's see how how it goes. Yes, of course. Of course. And we got one more community question, Terry, for you, which is quite of quite of an interesting one. If you have to choose one programming language, which will it be? <laughs> It's a topic so, maybe. <laughs> uh, so I would I would disappoint some people, but I'm I'm a JavaScript developer. Like I love JavaScript. That is my my first programming language I like I'm focused on. But I think Python is actually like it's coming back because I've used Python Python in the past, but I want to like regularly use it right now. And like I said, I, I've used Flux to build a web a a web app, which I want to do more. And I'll, yeah, I just want to document my 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 work on Python and share it with the with the community. So that is just my both JavaScript, JavaScript, both the framework, the libraries, anything on JavaScript. That, that is my first love. So Python is my second, and any other language I come across, uh, yeah, I'll learn it. All right, so JavaScript it is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Terry, thank you so much for the awesome talk and for the Q&A. And as you said, yeah, I think there will be plenty of more possibilities for you to teach our community about some, some things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'll, and, I'll, I'll look yeah. forward to it. And I'm always like open for, I'm always open. So always reach out to me. 
Yes, we will. Happy to hear that. And until then, Terry, I wish you a nice rest of the day and hopefully see you soon. <laughs> yeah. Bye, Terry. Yeah, bye. Have a nice one. Yeah, bye. All right. And now that also this live day slowly but surely comes to an end, just some quick information at the end. Uh, don't forget to check out the uh, meetup we are co-hosting, the Infobit Connect, in next week in Berlin. We'll post the link again in the chat. And when it comes to events, of course, there's also our World Congress back as an in-person event in July in Berlin. Um, just click the banner abo above the video to get further information and make sure to claim your tickets. And also, thanks so much to our partners who make all this possible. Uh, just scroll down on the live page a bit. We have clickable logos from them. Click through the stuff, look what they are offering, leave them some love on their websites. We would be appreciated. And also thanks to you, uh, to, to your viewers today. Thanks for engaging so much and uh, asking so much questions. It was really a blast today. I had so much fun. So did the speakers and I hope all, all of you too. And so I hope to see a lot of you again on April 12th next week when it's all about .NET. See you, see you soon, and until then, stay tuned. Bye. <laughs> Have you found your dream job as a developer? Or are you stuck in an unfulfilling job? On wearedevelopers.com, you find over a thousand jobs in Europe that fit the tech stack that you want to work with, and salaries go up to 130K. All you have to do is create a free profile, and you automatically get matched with jobs that fit your requirements. So what are you waiting for? Create your free profile and let companies apply to you now.